This is the August 22, uh, 2000 uh, meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Zo uh, Zoning Board of Appeals. Welcome to all in attendance. Um, we also want to welcome a new member of our board, uh, Jay Chapmas, um, who has joined us for his first meeting. Uh, the first item of business is the approval of the minutes of our last meeting held on July 25, 2000. Does, do uh, any of the board members have any comments, suggestions for changes on the minutes before we hear a motion for approval? On page three, line 19, and the minutes of 19 Ocean Avenue, comment about the conditions of the area that had not been met and that there is reason for variance when there are alternatives. Be, there is no reason for variance when there are alternatives. Um, I agree with that. Does everybody see that? <clears throat> and I'm hesitant on lines 26 and 28, uh, referring to Mr. Neely's uh, comments. Is possibility that Mr. Dent honestly believed that the variance that she received in 1996 had no terminated, termination date, especially since there was no paperwork to substantiate. I, I recommend that we, instead of since we say if because I don't know for the fact that there was no paperwork to substantiate it. And, and that was not introduced in evidence. So on line 27, page 3, line 27, change since to if? I would recommend that. As the board, I don't think it should intrinsically recognize that there was no paperwork without having evidence to that effect. Especially if there was no paperwork to substantiate that there was a termination date. Any other items for change? Other board members? Um, I noted a couple small things. Um, on page two, line 20, it, re it reads the practical, blues L-O-S-E should be practical loss, L-O-S-S. -S. Uh, page two, line 29, uh, the sentence reads, he, on, starting on the previous line, says, he also wanted to know if this was a true property line since there seemed to, it says show no iron pins shown. And I think it, the word show there should be changed to be, B-E, since there seemed to be no iron pins shown on the corners. Um, on line 33, same page, it says, Mr. Backer asked if there were others who wished to speak of Ms. Doucette's appeal. Um, I think it should read, Mr. Backer asked if there were others who wished to speak in opposition to the appeal, not speak of the appeal. And those are my only suggested changes. Any others? Um, can I hear a motion? Move to accept the minutes as amended. Um, all those in favor of approval of the minutes as amended? Um, five in favor, uh, one abstain. The next item on our agenda is old business. Do we have any old business to take up at this time? Hearing none, we'll go on to new business. 
The first item on the agenda of new business is to hear a referral from the Code Enforcement Office of a building permit application by Janine and Kenneth Forger, 3 C Barn Road, tax map U08, lot 42, to construct a deck addition at a reduced setback of 16 feet 0 inches from the rear property line as allowed under the procedures of section 19-7-10 of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance. Do we have people here on this agenda item? Um, Bruce, before we get started, would you give us a little background on this item, please? Uh, on May 30, I mean, March 30th of this year, um, I issued a permit for a deck at 16 feet from the property line uh, to Mr. and Mrs. Forget. Um On July 10th, um, David uh, Armstrong contacted me and, and brought to my attention that, that 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 was an error. I recognized the error and informed Mr. Forget that there was a problem. Uh, we discussed options and um, decided that the best way to handle it would be to to uh, go through the procedures of 19.710 for a 50 percent reduction to the required setbacks for that particular district uh, to see if that would remedy uh, the problem. Um, consequently, uh, the Armstrongs submitted a letter um, basically saying that they had a problem with, with the uh, application meeting the standards of section 1955, conditional use, and um, consequently I put it on the agenda for the board to hear as required under section 19710. Okay, thank you. I had um, handed to me immediately before the start of the hearing, a letter from David Armstrong on behalf of the abutting property owner. Um, are the, is either Janine or Kenneth Forget here? Um, Mr. Armstrong, have the Forgets received a copy of what you gave me? Yes, you gave me several copies of Schedule A, and I have distributed that to the members of the board. Uh, yeah, I also have a copy of Schedule B in the letter, but I didn't give it to the board, so I didn't think at this point it was relevant uh, to give it the applicable section of the zoning regulations, but I did have it already in the letter, so uh, what, what, I don't have a copy of that letter. Uh, could you just let me read, read uh, what I called it? Excuse well, me, since, excuse me, David. Point of order, can I ask, oh, can I ask a couple of questions here? Absolutely. Most, more specifically, the, uh, the letter from the uh, town council suggesting that um, we don't hear this because it's uh, out of our jurisdiction. Now, could I have a ruling on that? It clearly states that the, uh, the appeal pro uh, period had expired and the, um, the action really shouldn't be brought before us. Could I get an interpretation on that? Yes. I, we all should have an interpretation on that. I simply thought it important that the record be clear as to what was given to us this evening, and I want, simply wanted to determine whether the four J's had yeah, received Yeah, but if, if we don't hear it, then we don't need to have anything in the record. Um, with regard to the presentation of evidence, I agree. Um, but still, there has been something presented to us, and I think it's important that that simply be made a matter of record that it has been given to us. Um, your point is well taken. Um, the legal counsel for the town of Cape Elizabeth has presented the board with a legal opinion, and I know that a copy of this 
uh, letter dated August 11, 2000, uh, from the law firm of Monahan Leahy, uh, was sent to um, both the Forges and to Frederick Armstrong. Now, is Frederick Armstrong here? He is. Um, and it is the opinion of our legal counsel that the board does not have jurisdiction uh, to hear this matter this evening. And our legal counsel is here, and Mr. Armstrong, if, um, David Armstrong, if you. It will certainly allow you that opportunity. And if you would like to come up to the microphone, uh, to the podium, this would be the appropriate time to do that. Thank you. Excuse me one more time. I just, I just want a clarification of what's going on. We're hearing evidence tonight, right now, to determine whether we are going to d discuss this. Is that what we're doing? Um, we're hearing from David Armstrong. He'd simply like to comment or um, oppose, obviously, oppose, oppose that the that position that we do not have jurisdiction, and he apparently right. wants you, to contend that we do right. have jurisdiction. And then we'll take a vote as to determine whether we're going to hear this or whether yes. we're going to make a dis that, decision. That's that. my intention. Thank you, David. Um, I didn't know whether to, I guess I'm overdressed. If you don't mind. Let me pick up my deck. Rest or not. Uh, I'm David Armstrong, and I'm the son of Jane Armstrong, who lives next door to Mr. and Mrs. Forget. Uh, my mother's 90 years old. She's still good. She's still kicking and competent and still taking care of the house, but um, uh, she did not come this evening. Uh, the house uh, happens to be in a trust set up by my father, Frederick Armstrong, who, and uh, uh, my brother and I, are, he died nine years ago, and my brother and I are the trustees, so I can't sort of, I'm speaking for the owner, really, but, but my mother's the owner. It, the, having the trust owner is a formality, as you probably know. Um, my mother's lived there since 1941, when they built the house. Uh, my father passed away, as I said, nine years ago, but they raised their families there, and, and uh, I guess I'm trying to show that I'm really not an outsider, even though I don't live here anymore, but I lived here for 35 years. And, and, and Mr. Armstrong, excuse me, but before you get too far into this, bear in mind that the, what we're hearing at this point is um, comment limited to the question of whether or not this board has jurisdiction to hear the question. Okay. Um, I, can I just say one more thing, just to clear the air, because my mother's very upset the fact that she's been put in the position of the bad person and, 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 she, and objecting to this thing and that we're put in the position of the bad person. And she's gotten a lot, where I was going with that was that she's been there for 60 years and has never had a, a, any disagreement with any neighbor for 60 years. And this is a community, Ponco Park. It's a lot of people in close together. And, and so I also like to say that, that, that she or we have nothing personal against the Forges. We think they're wonderful people and, and, we, and we don't want to, we're just, my mother's very concerned about living the last few years of her life having a fight with her neighbor and she doesn't want that and she wanted me to let that be known. That, that well, re rest nothing. assured, I think that I speak for the board when I say that we certainly don't view um, anybody, um, any party on either side of an issue before us as the, oh, but, the good party or the evil party and we certainly don't view uh, your mother as an objector. Well, um, any time you object to something as being a bad someone person. else wants to do, you know, she feels you're, you're making waves and, 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 and it bothers her. So uh, I just wanted to say that for her. I told her I would say that. And, and, uh, I think it's important uh, to, in, in discussing this issue of, of whether you have jurisdiction, to, to look at the facts briefly. I, I passed out that fact uh, sheet, Schedule A, and uh, because we have to look at the facts in the two cases cited by Attorney Hill to see whether or not the, case, the cases that he cited are relevant to this case. 
Obviously, if the facts are different, then the cases are of no merit and, and, and do not bind you, and, and you are free to, to look at the merits of the issue. Very briefly, on, <clears throat> uh, and would you like to give the Forges a copy of that now? If it is an extra copy so they can have it, because I didn't mean not to give them. Didn't you give them that one? <clears throat> this, Mr. Forget's property and the Armstrong property are in the residential A district. They, it also, both parcels are also in the shoreland overlay districts district within 250 feet of the shoreline. Both lots are non-conforming lots. Both buildings are non-conforming buildings. As I said, the Armstrong property is on the rear line, abuts the rear line of the Forget property. You probably have a map that uh, moves probably out to it. But, um, the first permit was issued that hasn't been mentioned, was issued in, in December of 99, about seven months ago, eight, I guess it's now nine months ago, allowing the Forgers to build an extension on the house, not a deck, but a real, a real building, onto the rear side of their house. And, and this, this deck goes over into the 30-foot setback area, 30-foot setbacks for residential R when you're in a shoreland zoning, and, and it goes four feet over into that into the, the setback area. But that's not the issue here today. Not that, that's done and, and, it was, and it's built. The second permit was issued on March 30th, and the permit uh, allowed for the construction of a deck, which is allowed under Section uh, 19710. It's a special provision for decks and pools and, and, and small buildings, and you can build them into the setback, the 30-foot setback area, and, and the section 1930-10, I'm sorry, 19710 specifically says that, that the limitations on the residential districts and the limitations of the shoreland zoning districts do not apply to this provision that allows you to build decks and pools within halfway into the, the setback area. It allows you to build them if you go through the procedures set forth in 19710, and that is give notice to everybody and let them make a, a comment as to whether that meets the requirements of the conditional use um, standards. Unfortunately, no notice was sent to the Armstrongs or I think any other any of the other abutters, and they had no actual knowledge of the fact that the, it, that the permit had been issued. It was issued on March. Uh, 30th, and there was no building begun until at least after June 18th, which is when I happened to be here for my mother's 90th birthday, and it hadn't been constructed. So nothing was done on the property during the, the quote, 30-day appeal period uh, for whatever, if that's important. In fact, the, the, the permit should not have been issued under 19710. Instead, notice should have been given to the abutters to come out and complain or, or contest the, the building of the, of the deck. Subsequently, after, say, two and a half months, uh, the deck was, in fact, partially completed between June 19th and, and July 10th. On July 10th, as Bruce said, I, I contacted him by telephone and, and asked him what was going on because it, it, the deck was being built into the 30-foot setback area. We hadn't gotten notice of that. Bruce recognized the error and immediately sent out a notice under 19710 and, um, and gave notice to Mr. Forget to stop construction, either call it a revocation of the, of the building permit or a stop building order, whatever it's called. Uh, he gave him notice. and. It was on the same letter that the abutters got notice of the fact that he was filing an application to build the deck. The, we then, my, my brother, on, on behalf of the trust, filed an objection, as is, as is required under the notice that was given on July 11th, and uh, within the 30 days allowed, and, and filed his objection, which is in your files, or it's in the files of the CEO. And that was what was to be heard tonight. 
the Mr. Hill, the town attorney, oh, by the way, um, after getting that notice to cease construction, Mr. Forge finished the porch. I don't know how much he did. Uh, I know that the, all the railings were not up. There might have been more. I sort of said railings in, the, in, the, in my list of facts. I don't know whether there were other things that hadn't been done, but I know the railings hadn't been up. Uh, he then finished and, and, and put them up in spite of the, the order. During the 30-day period after Mr. Smith's order to Mr. Forget not to build anymore, a, a recession, if you will, of the permit, Mr. Forget did not appeal that, that order of Mr. Smith. Smith. Mr. Smith set out an order on, on the, uh, July 11th, and no appeal was taken within the 30-day period that would, he, he had to appeal to, to the order to cease and desist construction of the porch and, and the revocate, revocation of the building permit. I didn't put that last, that last one is not on there. That would be number 12 on your list if you, the failure of him to appeal. Mr. Hill relies in his opinion that, that, that you should not hear this petition, this, um, I guess our appeal of his 19710 notice uh, because of uh, two cases. One took place in Kenny Bunk and one took place in Poland. In the Kenny Bunk case, which was a, was a law court case, a, a Supreme Court case, uh, the, the facts, there's about six or seven facts that are important, and then there's about three that are distinguishable. If I could very quickly give the facts of that case, I, you, you may or may not have read it. Uh, if you, I used to be on this board one time, 25 years ago, and, and I don't remember reading too many things before the meeting, so I'm assuming you haven't read the cases and digest them and taken notes, so I'm going to uh, maybe just give you five facts. The, CEO of Kenny Bunk issued a permit for building of a house on May 1st. Two days later, the CEA gave actual notice to the abutter, Mr. Wright. So Mr. Wright, the abutter, had actual notice two days after the building permit was issued. Keep in mind that in, in our case, after this building permit was issued, no notice was sent to anybody, and nobody, the Armstrongs anyway, had, did not have actual notice. Not only did we have actual notice, we did not get the notice we should have gotten under 19710. On June 14th, which is 34 days after the appeal period, I mean 30 day, 34 days after the uh, issuance of the permit, Mr. Wright objected. He filed a, an objection with the city and he filed an action in court. The CEO, no, he, I, the CEO uh, refused to take action and revoke the building permit. In our case, Mr. Smith did in fact revoke the building permit. So there's another fact difference. In that case, he, he refused to because he felt that he was right, that that is the CEO. Mr. Smith uh, recognized the problem and issued a, a revocation. The board heard the appeal in Kenny Bunk, and the board um, held that the permit was issued in error, and the Supreme Court decided to uphold the board's decision. Superior Court, sorry, the lower court. The Supreme Court reversed and held and that's the, that's the case that you've got attached to that letter. That, do they have copies of that letter, by the way, from Mr. Hill? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, the distinguishing facts on these cases are, of course, that Mr. Wright had actual notice within the 30-day appeal period, as a matter of fact, two days after it was issued. Secondly, the statute did not require notice to abutters. Obviously, if, if a person who, who doesn't, isn't supposed to get a notice, but might have actual notice, uh, doesn't get notice, it seems to me it's a lot more, he has a lot more right to get notice than someone who just might happen along and see the problem. Certainly someone who under the statute is supposed to get notice has, has a, ought to be heard, I guess. And it seems to me his right to notice is just as important as the builder's right to, to you know, be able to build a, build a structure. In 
uh, in that case, there is a footnote number three. And that, this is the only part of the, of the case I'm going to read you, so I'm not going to go through this whole thing. Footnote number three. Let me tell you what it says. It says that the court is not going to try to decide the case of what do you do if the abutter doesn't have notice. It says we aren't going to decide. We don't have to decide it. We're not going to. But you can clearly see that the court, the law court, felt that it was a different fact situation if if there's no if it was no notice. They don't even get to the point of what do you do when there's supposed to be notice given by, by the town and no notice was given. So it seems to me that footnote number three, <coughs> which, is, which is on, uh, well, it's near the end of the case, um, is, makes that case irrelevant to this situation because we don't, the court themselves are saying we don't know what we would do if, if, the, if the abutter hadn't gotten notice. Okay, second case, Giuliano versus the town of Poland. In the Poland case, the CEO issued a building permit to Mr. Giuliano in 1995. Then a couple of years later, the, the CEO retired or left or whatever. And a new CEO was put in his place. The new CEO said, I don't think that building permit was right. And so he issued a withdrawal of the building permit. The problem is, it was two years since the building permit had been issued, not two months. So two years after the building permit's issued, the, the, um, the new building uh, CEO uh, issues a, a, a rescission or a stop, stop building order. The court held that the new, that the new, um, CEO's revocation of that building permit was like an abutter appealing the decision. And they said, well, he should, the new building, it should have been done within 30 days, and the new building, the new, new CEO doesn't have any right to do that after, after two years. The, the Board of Appeals held that, that the uh, they, 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 upheld, they stayed with the CEO and said he was right, and the Supreme Court uh, overruled the Superior Court and, and held that it was too late to, to revoke the permit. What are the distinguishing facts here? The first one is that the permit was, uh, was um, two years later, and it was not by the same CEO. In our case, Bruce gave the permit and then he took away the permit. In this case, he, the guy gave the permit and someone else took it away two years later. In the Poland case, the, the, um, the court continued to cite the Kenny Bunk case and, and, and in, as I said, in both cases, notice was not required of the abutters. So that's, again, notice was not required in, this, in, the, in, the, in the Poland case. My thinking is then that we have two orders issued by the CEO here. And neither one was appealed within 30 days. The first one wasn't, and the last one wasn't. And now we're in a quandary as to what to do. You are. It seems to me that under the authority given you by the code, that you have clear jurisdiction to, to decide on all cases dealing with orders by the CEO. And that is your job. And, and to, to rectify, if there's any errors, to rectify those errors. And if there aren't, to, to go along with them. In this case, You've got two orders, no appeals, and you've got to decide whether you're going to hear the case on the merits. My wish is, or hope is, or request is, that you assert your, your duties and, and take up your responsibilities and, and hear the case on the merits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong. Ask, does anyone have any questions? I'll be glad to ask any questions. Any questions for Mr. Armstrong? 
But uh, how did you first become aware? What was it? You saw the construction being done. Well, I, I was up for, as I said, in July, on June 18th, my mother's birthday, and I, I saw the construction of the of the new house, the, the new. It's a it's a major piece of work. It's not just a deck. But the deck hadn't been started, as far as I could see, and I, I spoke with Mr. Forge for a while, and I, I was right in front of his house, and I didn't notice even a footing or anything going in. So I did, was not aware of it, no. And and I, I, but I was told by my family that in fact they were building a porch. I said, wait a minute, you're not supposed to do that. That's when I called Bruce to get clarification as to what was going on. Was it built? Okay. That's all right. I, well, I want to know. Did you look at the building? There was a requirement that the building permit be posted during construction. Does that building permit specify what's being constructed, Bruce? That has yeah. to be posted? Yes, it does. Okay. Did, did you look at that building no. permit? I, I stood at the head of the driveway, which is uh, 80 feet, 60, 70 feet away from the, from the house. I, I didn't notice any, but I wasn't. I, I wasn't I might have, if I had, I probably would have thought it was the building permit for the one he was just finishing, the major one. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Armstrong, just so the record is clear, and I may have cre created some ambiguity here by not having you better identify yourself before you started to speak, but you are David Armstrong, David Armstrong. Um, trustee of the Armstrong Trust, which is the owner of the property, and your address is what? My address is, well, my address is 4644. Uh, Kitty Wake Court in Boynton Beach, Florida. It's on my letter okay. that I wrote to you that has my address on it. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask... Uh, can I, can I say one more thing? I don't understand, I guess. I put a number of calls into Mike to, once I found out that, that he was going to write this letter because I was told he was going to write this letter by, or he'd written the letter by my brother, but my brother hadn't got a copy yet or something. And, and he didn't call me back. And I thought, well, maybe he's the attorney. Maybe he's not supposed to talk to me. I don't know. But... Uh, I called him a couple of times and left long messages. And, and then I began to think coming up here today that it seems to me that the town attorney has just as much a responsibility to a butters as, it does, as he does to people at a building. And I'm very surprised that Mr. Hill, who's an excellent attorney, I understand, wouldn't, rec wouldn't comment that there was a, a footnote number three on this, on this Kenny Bunk case or footnote number two on the on the uh, Poland case, which is, it, you have to admit it raises a huge uh, area of concern. It may not be, you may not want to go along, but it seems to me that, that there, I hope that you feel that, that you and the attorney have, a, have just as much of an obligation to, to help out the people who are the abutters as you do the people who are doing the building. Thank you. Well, let me respond to that briefly. First of all, Mr. Hill did provide each of the members um, of the board through um, our code enforcement officer. Uh, who in turn passed on to us uh, Mr. Hill's letter with copies of the two cases that you have um, alluded to. I personally have read both cases um, a few times in preparation for tonight. I don't know what the practice of the other board members have been, but my experience with them on this board is that I would bet that every one of them um, have read uh, Mr. Hill's letter along with both of the cases that accompanied Mr. Hill's letter. Um, I read all three of the footnotes uh, to the Kenny Bunkport case. Um, they're in the case, they're not hidden. Um, I was aware of them. Um, I expected you to refer to footnote three in your comments. Um, my guess is that each of the board members up here did. Um, I'd like Mr. Hill to respond just with regard to the legal arguments and to, um, again, give us his opinion legally as to whether or not this board has jurisdiction uh, to take this matter up at this time. Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Michael Hill uh, from Monaghan Leahy. Uh, first, I'd like to apologize to Mr. Armstrong for not returning his phone call. Um, I, I, was, I did take a few days off, and I was out on vacation all of last week. When I returned, um, I had a voicemail message from your attorney, and so it was inappropriate for me to call you at that point once I know that you're represented by counsel. Uh, I'm not supposed to get in touch with 
with you, but I apologize for not getting in touch with you the week before I um, when I'm I could. With respect to the um, issues raised by Mr. Armstrong, uh, I would respectfully disagree that uh, those cases are distinguishable. Uh, the footnote three in the Wright uh, versus uh, Kenny Bunk case um, reads that um, because of the facts of this case do not merit such a determination, we need not decide whether a court can grant an extension of time within which to appeal with, uh, within which to appeal to an aggrieved party who does not have knowledge of the issuance of a permit until after the appeal period has expired. Uh, in those uh, situations in which the applicable ordinance designates an appeal period but does not provide for a waiver of limitations period upon a showing of good cause, uh, that footnote may give a uh, court of competent jurisdiction the right to extend an appeal period. But it does not say that a zoning board of appeals may extend. Uh, previous cases uh, from the main Supreme Court, uh, the uh, Keating case, limit that uh, exception to a court of competent jurisdiction. In the Giuliano versus Town of Poland case, footnote two in that case says, we note that the ordinance specifies a definite appeal period, and although we have implied a good cause exception in ordinances without definite appeal periods, such a good cause exception cannot be implied when the ordinance prescribes a specific appeal period. Um, it would, it's my opinion, uh, opinion of our firm, that once the 30-day uh, appeal period has expired on the issuance of a building permit, that uh, this board is without jurisdiction to hear an appeal or revoke that permit. A court of competent jurisdiction may decide that for good cause shown, they are going to read that in uh, to our ordinance, and a court of competent jurisdiction could either remand the matter to this board uh, in order that you do have jurisdiction and to hear the case, or they may, uh, uh, a court may uh, decide to have an evidentiary hearing before the court and make that uh, decision itself. So uh, I think that the two-year time frame in the Giuliano case between the issuance of the building permit and the stop work order is not what was uh, of uh, critical importance in that case. The importance in that case was that the 30-day appeal period had expired. That's the same fact pattern that we have here. I'd like to also uh, disagree with Mr. Armstrong that he was entitled to, to notice of the permit that Mr. Smith issued for the deck. Uh, and, and perhaps the board would want to hear from Bruce on this, but my understanding was that uh, the error that Mr. Smith made was thinking that this property was in the RC district and so that the deck was uh, as proposed was within the applicable setbacks. That's correct. Okay. So um, the permit that was issued was not issued pursuant to 19710. It was, uh, it, and therefore no notice was required for the building permit that Mr. Smith issued. So I think it uh, is not the fact pattern of this case that the uh, abutter was entitled to notice and didn't get it with the permit that Mr. Smith did issue. Um, so I stand by our opinion that uh, this board does not have jurisdiction uh, to hear the matter because a 30-day time appeal, uh, appeal period has expired. 
Mr. Chairman, can I address a question to you first? Is the matter before the board the building permit or the rescission, or both? There's no, if I can answer, there's no rescission, you, per se. The, the permit, because, because of the circumstances, the permit was on hold pending whether there was going to be somebody that came forward and whether the board has jurisdiction to hear it. So it's not rescinded. It was just put on hold. And if, and if the issue is that the board, the board doesn't have jurisdiction, then that goes by the wayside. If, am I correct? That, that's our opinion, yes. Mr. Hill, can you tell me what the remedy would be for any abutter if they find that a building permit has been issued in error and they are not informed of it? Uh, do they have to live with any violation of the setback ordinances then? Because they, don't, because they weren't informed and therefore don't have the right to appeal beyond the, the time limit? Well, I, I think that uh, the action that an abutter would take is exactly what the Armstrongs uh, seek to do tonight, uh, although it was, it was kind of brought up in a different way because Bruce recognizing his error uh, and wanting to uh, correct the error uh, issued the uh, notice under 19 710 for the reduction in the setback for the deck. Um, however, the, the deck permit, once issued and the 30-day appeal period having expired, uh, there is a strong uh, thread through all of these cases of that a landowner should have certainty in when they when they get a permit and the appeal period has expired, that they should be able to proceed uh, with, with certainty. And so the, I hope I'm addressing your question, but that the 30-day the appeal period having expired, um, a, a, an abutting property owner who objects to that would exhaust its administrative remedies by appealing that to this board. I think under the existing case law, it's clear that this board does not have jurisdiction, and then the remedy for the abutter is to appeal that to superior court and argue that they have the um, that there's a good cause. Uh, they have a good cause for an extension of the 30-day time period, uh, and can appeal. Cases. Uh, Ordinances which don't have a specified time period for an appeal, the court has read into them a reasonable time period of 60 days. They've also read in a good cause exception which can extend that 60 days to avoid a flagrant miscarriage of justice is the term that's been used by uh, main courts. So the abutter would argue to the uh, superior court that in order to avoid a flagrant miscarriage of justice that um, their appeal should be heard. So that's that's the procedural uh, avenue that uh, an abutter could take. Does the town acknowledge that the abutters had no knowledge of the trend of the extension of the deck into a prohibited area prior to its, its construction? I, I can't answer that question. It, it, makes, it, it doesn't make any difference whether the error was made or not. The, the same procedure took place here as it does for everybody. You issue a permit, anybody has a right to appeal that issuance within the 30-day period. Whether, whether the permit's issued right or wrong is not the issue. The issue is whether somebody exercised that right within the 30-day period. And I'm trying to establish the fact there was no notice given to the abutters regarding the issuance of this permit and what it, and what it applied to. There would not be a notice to this abutter or any abutters on any building permit at, uh, issuance. Right. Okay. right then. And then, Mr. Hill, how do you address Mr. Armstrong's point that uh, the uh, first case cited is not, is not on point because there, there was explicit notification of abutters? I mean, well, you, I you're I'm relying a decision on, on this case law and Mr. Armstrong's point that it's not applicable because this considered an informed uh, uh, people who knew 
what was going on uh, did not raise a timely objection. And that his point is that doesn't, as I understand, that doesn't apply to this case. I, I thought I had addressed that, that um, the, the permit that was issued by Mr. Smith did not require notice. The, the law court has set aside the issue as to how they would decide a case. Um, they, they say, we need not decide whether a court can grant an extension of time within which to appeal to an aggrieved party who does not have knowledge of the issuance of a permit until after the appeal period has expired. They didn't decide that case. What they said, though, is that a court can decide that case. They, don't, they did not say that a zoning board of appeals has the jurisdiction to decide that case. Yeah, no, that's not my point. My point is, is this case relevant to this, ca to this case? Uh, absolutely. I, I believe the right, right versus... Uh, and Mr. Armstrong's point is that they're disanalogous because of the, of the information the dispensation involved in one case, but not in this case. And you're saying it is analogous because... It, it may be a factor for a court of competent jurisdiction in determining whether there's uh, a right to an extension of the appeal period, but it doesn't change, in my opinion, it does not change um, that this board does not have the authority to hear this appeal once the 30-day time period is up. Our ordinance uh, provides that this board may hear appeals from any decision of the code enforcement officer within 30 days and that's the extent of your jurisdiction under our ordinance. And we cannot read into the ordinance an exception to that. I'm not saying that a court cannot do that, but I'm saying my reading of these cases is that the Zoning Board of Appeals cannot read anything into this ordinance. You don't have that jurisdiction. I'd also like to point out that we uh, six or seven years ago, there was a similar case where um, a property owner wanted to put on a, a dormer to his home. Uh, the permit was issued. There was a delay in the contractor starting um, construction uh, of approximately six months. When construction started, the abutter uh, who had no notice of the uh, issuance of the building permit, uh, immediately requested a stop work order from the uh, then CEO who refused to issue a stop work order. That matter was appealed to this board, which held that it did not have jurisdiction to hear an appeal from uh, the issuance of a building permit after the 30-day time period had expired. That case was appealed under Rule 80B to the Superior Court, which upheld this board's decision that it did not have jurisdiction to hear that matter. Um, that case did not go to the law court, but it, it did, you know, it, it ended there at the Superior Court. So uh, this board, none of the members were, uh, none of the present members were on that board, but uh, this board does have its own precedence that it has determined it did not have jurisdiction to hear an appeal after the 30-day appeal period was over, and that decision has been upheld by Maine Superior Court. I ask Bruce, what is the rule regarding the posting of the building permit? Is it as soon as it's issued or when construction has begun? It, it just says that the building permit must be posted, that's all it said. So, I mean, I would assume that you have to post it when the construction starts. So um, I think that um, it would be appropriate to um, ask if uh, Mr. Armstrong or Mr. Forget had any additional comments on whether the board has jurisdiction and then have a vote on whether uh, the board feels it has jurisdiction. Are there any other questions for, for me? Thank you, Mr. Hill. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, you may. Thank you. Uh, first, the 
position of Mr. Hill that you guys don't have authority to act if the Supreme Court Maine puts in a footnote that the case that the case that they just decided isn't going to apply to someone who doesn't get or there's a good chance that it won't apply, if, if they thought it was, they wouldn't have mentioned it, that it isn't going to apply to someone that didn't get notice and doesn't even go the extra step up to talk about someone who was supposed to get notice, which I'll get to in a minute. It seems a little ludicrous to say that you, ha you don't have authority over your own CEO and you've got to make everybody go to court and spend a lot of money to decide a case that you can decide based on what the court says. I do tax work a lot, and when the, when the tax court says, you know, that you can't do something in, in dictum, you know, you listen to it and you tell your clients that's the way they ought to act. I mean, I don't, I don't understand how you can say that what a tax court, what, what the Supreme Court says in a footnote <coughs> shouldn't control your actions. I, I just think that's wrong. In both cases, keep in mind, the Poland case and the Kennebunk case, no notice was required and no notice, no actual knowledge, they determined this, that, that, that the, uh, there was no actual knowledge. And the Poland case keeps citing the Kenny Bunk case. So if you throw the Kenny Bunk case out on this footnote three, then most of what it says in the Poland case about that issue, or they adopt footnote three. When they cite the case, they adopt footnote in Poland, they adopt the case for, for Kenny Bunk. I think that a statement that Bruce made that I, I disagree with and was that, that there is no uh, need to give a notice. I'm reading Bruce's, Bruce's notice of reduction in setbacks, July 11th, and he cites Article 7, Section 19.7.10 of the Cables of Zoning Ordinance, allows side or rear setbacks to be reduced by not less than 50% of the setbacks required in the district within which a principal building is located for a deck having a height of less than 10 feet. Well, now, what's, what section is he in when he issued, the, issued this? I mean, and it's clear, and then down below it says Section 19.7.10b requires notification to abutters. I mean, that's pretty crystal clear that the, that the section they're relying on requires notice. And if you look at that section, of course, it requires notice to all the butters. So to say that the, that the, that the ordinance, I'm sorry, that the, uh, the building permit didn't require notice because if you, if you didn't do it under this section, you couldn't do it under any other section. That's the point. So he tried to do it under this. He did a good faith effort to give notice. He put the building permit on hold and he gave 30 days to appeal. And that was an action on his part, by the way, don't forget. And so if, you know, he filed that action and if you don't allow, and no appeal, and it seems now you, gotta, you ought to listen to the merits of his, his second action, as well as you listen to it on the first action. I mean, there's a 30 day period that ran, nobody objected to his, to his, note, to his, uh, his notice and his citation of, of 19710, because if you get into these other sections, it's, it's our opinion, we didn't discuss them because that's not relevant, I, don't, I didn't think it was relevant for this first threshold issue, that, that you can't put this deck into this Shoreland zoning 30 foot setback area without going in under 19710. I'd also like to point out that your, that your statute, if you read it, uh, says that any person may appeal within 30 days. And um, David, maybe you could help me with that site, that page number if anyone else is looking. I, it's, um, That's section 19-5-3. Right. And, and am I right? It says any, any party may appeal. That is not like the Kenny, that's not like the Poland case in which it said all persons must appeal within 30 days. So Poland has a totally different statute than, than, than Cape Elizabeth. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Forger, um, you are certainly not obligated to 
make any presentation to the board, but you're certainly welcome to if you would like to address the issue of whether or not this board has jurisdiction to hear the matter before us this evening. Um, since the microphone couldn't pick up your, your statement, would you mind, Mr. Forger? Um, I'm sorry, I should have asked you to come to the microphone. No, no, I, I don't. Uh, and if you'd just simply identify yourself by name no, and address, I'm Kent please. Uh, either two or three C Bond Road, I don't know. I haven't, well, I guess the police department said it's still two. But uh, no, I agree with Mr. Hill's uh, determination, and I'd ask the board to, to uphold his, his uh, opinion. All right, thank you. Um, having heard the um, legal arguments, uh, factual and legal arguments of uh, David Armstrong, and having heard comments from the town uh, legal counsel, Michael Hill, do any other members of the board have questions? Are we in the Shoreland zoning area. Is that the correct zoning? Yes, we are. For this property and not RC. That's correct. No, it's RA overlaid by Shoreland zoning. Okay, RA. Based on the information given to us in the RA zoning, why? Is this permit in violation of the ordinance right now, or is it in violation of the ordinance? The setbacks for an RA district is 20 feet to the rear, and the deck permit was issued at 16 feet to the rear property line. So it's four feet into the... And it cannot be reduced by 50 percent? It can be reduced by 50 percent through 19710. And that means notification to all the abutters, or to the abutter? Yes. So that would have been the correct procedure then? If, if you recognize this as an RA zone, RA zone, then you would have tried to reduce it down by 50%, sent out a notice, waited, what, 30 days for, for all right? Correct. All right, so that didn't happen. And that's why Mr. Armstrong is upset. If that happened, then it comes to us. Is that correct? Only if, only if, if there's evidence brought forth by an abutter who, who feels that one or more of the conditions of Section 1955 are not met. Okay. Do you feel as though one or more of the conditions of 1955 have not been met? Mr. Not. Chairman, I, I think this goes to. Uh, well, what I'm. This goes to substance. I think this is getting ahead of the point of order. Okay, I, I'll. Yeah, Mr. Fristassi, I'll, again, I'll I, yield. I, I'm just. I, I hate I'm, to straddle the issue of whether or not we're going to hear the factual merits of this or whether we're going to stick. I, and I agree, and I'm whether sorry. Whether we should be hearing it at all. I'm, I'll agree, and I'm sorry, and I'll wait and, and see. Uh, Thank what, you, Mr. Cross. Was there anything else? I disagree that the setbacks allow a build a structure within the 30 foot rear setback area of a, of a shoreland zoning area because it specifically says in the code that it doesn't, and, and, and therefore it's not 20 foot, it's 30 foot, unless you go on to 1970. We aren't even getting to that issue no, yet. But, we won't get to that issue unless we determine that we have jurisdiction to hear the matter. So what I would like to um, hear from someone at this point is a motion um, as to whether the board does or does not have jurisdiction uh, to hear the matter uh, raised by the Armstrongs. Mr. Chairman, I, I would like to have some open discussion so the, the board members can get a sense of other people's views of whether or not our 
Uh, this is properly before us, before we introduce motions. Is, can we have a little open discussion? Is that, is that yeah, certainly we can have we can have discussion without a motion on the floor. Yeah. Well, I realized we're a, com a committee of the town, and it's difficult to go against the opinion rendered by uh, by the town's attorney. Uh, I guess I, I don't see the cases he cited as being on point on the grounds that uh, of, of notification. Uh, I don't see the Kennebunk case as being on point because footnote three, and I don't see the I see too many disanalogies with the uh, uh, town of Poland case. Uh, and if that's the basis under which we should uh, not hear this, then. Uh, I mean, th it just doesn't appear to be uh, 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 on point to me. And in the absence of that, then is there any other reason we should not hear it? That's just my a comment. I have two points to that. Um, first, I, I agree with the town attorney's opinions as to this applying. Um, and two points in response. Um, first, under our authority, under strict application, we have 30 days, or an appeal can be made within 30 days of issuance of building permit, regardless of that building permit is issued right and wrong. This case, it was issued in error, but we still, the, appeal, the appellate period is still 30 days. Second, even if that notice was not given, and I'm, I know we're not getting into the issue of to whether or not notice was necessary for the original building permit. We know it wasn't. Mm. Assuming, let's just say for the sake of argument, that notice was required in that original building permit, which was issued in March, and it wasn't given, taking his position to the utmost. We still don't have the authority to extend it beyond 30 days. The appeal procedure is 30 days. And if we are now to, the, for us to consider that tonight, our ordinance would have to give us the authority to hear appeals within 30 days or for good exception. And we don't have for that good exception, or for good cause, or for any exceptional circumstances. So without that language permitting us to do it, we can't do it. I would agree with you 100% if the code enforcement officer hadn't gone, taken a separate step, have issued a cease work order, and gone under uh, 197, uh, uh, where he intrinsically recognized that an error was made and threw it open. It's not as if he issued a building permit, no, no appeal was made, construction was begun, and the neighbors appealed months later. It is the town recognized that this should not have been done. And at that point, notice was given. So that is a different situation. I it's agree not with like that. the simple case where building permit, no appeal, construction goes on. And I agree with that entirely, except for the fact that that decision and the town's decision that this is an error is only justification as to why the appeal period should be extended. It doesn't change the fact that the original building permit was issued in March, and 30 days from that March date would be sometime in April. That's so that doesn't change it. And we, our, our ordinance doesn't allow us any more time. And that's why I asked Mr. Hill what the uh, relief was for an abutter who finds that uh, somebody is building within, uh, illegally within setbacks. Is it that he wasn't, wasn't aware it was permitted, construction was not begun until several months later, does he have to go to the main superior court or the main supreme court with all the legal expenses associated with that because the town made a mistake? Unfortunately, and I say it, that's, that strikes me as something that we can deal with at, at the local level without uh, having citizens go through all the trouble and expense of appealing to, a, to, to, the, uh, to the court system. Well, and just it's unfortunate that a court is the remedy, but, on, but we're limited only to what we can do, and the town council has pointed that out, and the courts are just the next step up. It's not that friendly, unfriendly of a venue. So I disagree, and I think we're, I'm ready for a motion on this. Mr. Cronin, I'd like to say that I share your views to some extent. Um, and I think the extent to which I share them is the, the, one of the questions you raised, and the question is, what is the remedy of an abutter who didn't receive notice, didn't know and had no way of knowing within 30 days from the issuance of the permit, and therefore didn't appeal and lost their rights when a building permit was improperly issued? Do they simply have to live with 
the violation? And is there any remedy? And it seems to me that the answer to that is they have to live with the mistake. That seems to be the answer that the court is giving unless the abutter takes the matter to either the superior court or to the main supreme judicial court. As a member of the board, I'm not pleased with that result because it doesn't seem equitable. But if you're balancing, I, we have a balancing of, of harms here. We have a property owner uh, who has gone to the expense and built a deck um, based in reliance upon a permit that was improperly issued. And we have an abutter that has um, an infringement into a setback that the abutter doesn't want to live with and shouldn't have had to live with if they had been given proper notice, perhaps, mm -hmm. if the conditional use um, standards hadn't been met. If we're weighing those inequities, inequities, which side do we come down on? I don't know what the answer to that is. There's no easy answer. It's not a position that the town wants to find itself in. We'd like to think that, that mistakes never happen, but they do. Uh, this is a case where one did happen. Um, and now who bears, who bears the harm from the, from the mistake? Um, is it the abutter or is it the property owner who has to take down the deck um, if the court rules that the abutter is within its rights in raising the objection after 30 days. Um, Mr. Hill has told us that we don't have the power to make that decision tonight. Um, right or wrong, um, I'm prepared to rely upon the advice given to us by our counsel. Um, if the main Supreme Judicial Court um, ultimately, as a result of this case, issues a new opinion, uh, a new decision based on these facts that says that the board uh, did have jurisdiction and should have had the authority to make a decision tonight, then all um, zoning boards of appeal will know that from the date of that decision. But right now, it seems to be an unclear um, area that um, I'm willing to follow the advice of our counsel on, um, recognizing that there's an expense that may be unjust incurred by the abutter who through no fault of their own finds themselves um, in this position of not having received notice. But, um, no, not, not at this stage. So that's where I stand on it. My, it's not, I, my sympathies certainly lie with both sides here, but as a legal uh, position, um, it seems to me that the right one is to follow the advice of our, of our counsel. Other comments? Just a comment that the board does have the right to interpret the ordinance. It, we're invest, invested with that right and in, in terms of our powers and whatnot. But. It, we, we are indeed um, invested with that power to interpret it. And it, well, okay, and let me pursue that, and then I think we should interpret reasonably. And uh, it strikes me as unreasonable to, to force an, an aggrieved abutter who suffered an injustice to under, undertake all this expense uh, when it could be settled right here. I mean, we can go all the way up down to the court and we kick back to us, then we can decide. We can just decide, and if, if either side is agreed with our decision, they, they can appeal it from there. Or we can. It's actually as a tempest in a teapot that can be settled at a, at a local level with minimal expense, and that we should do so. But I, I understand the positions of other members of the board. But I just can't see that somebody, if the town makes a mistake, then, then let's go from there. Let's not just sweep it under the rug and say, well, take it to the court because we're, we don't have it. I, don't, I, I can see arguments on both sides. But in terms of practical, addre practically addressing the issue, it could be settled right here and save a lot of people a lot of money. Other comments or a motion? 
I'll make a motion to um, dismiss this matter on the basis that we do not have jurisdiction in that the Armstrongs did not, um, for no fault of their own, um, did not file a appeal within 30 days of the March 2000 building permit um, as required to preserve their rights to appeal under Section 19.53 of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance. Do I hear a second? I second. Discussion on the motion? I think I'll reserve my comments. <laughs> um, hearing no it's a, it's, a, it's a hard situation, and I, and I agree with Bob, and, and uh, you know, after hearing the arguments uh, earlier uh, by uh, Mr. Armstrong, you know, I, I was uh, basically prepared to, uh, to dismiss this, but I, I, I agree with Bob that we should discuss it and, and but we don't have the jurisdiction. If, if, we, if we heard it tonight and discussed it and voted against Mr. Forger, he can take it to the Supreme, uh, Supreme Court because we didn't have the jurisdiction. So I'm going by the, the uh, uh, Attorney Hill's uh, um, memo to us, letter to us, and, and rely upon his judgment. He's, he hasn't misled us uh, in the several years that I've been here, and that's what we pay him the big bucks for. In case anybody thinks being a lawyer is easy, <laughs> this is a, a good example of uh, the client turning to a legal counsel for a clear answer when there isn't one, and uh, counsel's opinion is on the line. Um, hearing no other discussion, um, all those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Uh, the motion passes uh, five to one. Uh, five in favor, one opposed. Um, the uh, appeal of the Armstrongs um, is dismissed for lack of jurisdiction. The next item on the agenda is uh, to hear the variance appeal of John Van Dis, 905 Shore Road, tax map U04, lot 61, for a left side property line variance of four feet from the required 20 feet, zero inches, to construct a detached garage at 16 feet, zero inches from said property line. Is anyone here on behalf of that matter? Come forward. <laughs> and uh, would you tell us your name and address, please? Uh, my name is John Bandis and 905 Shore Road, Cape Elizabeth. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Vandis. before um, you make any presentation to us, um, if I could ask our code enforcement officer, uh, Mr. Smith, to give us a bit of background on this. Permit was um, applied for on August uh, 7th to build a garage uh, detached at 16 feet from the uh, left property line. The uh, lot is in the residential C district. 
and it's what we call a conforming lot, meaning it's more than 20,000 square feet. Uh, as a consequence, uh, because he was four feet too close to the property line, the permit was denied, and um, he chose to appeal to this board for a variance of four feet. Anything else, Mr. Smith? Is that no, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Van Dis. Um, I guess after hearing the last case, I'll start with I have a, a note that our neighbor who is, shares that luck, our luck line with us, our buddy neighbor, wrote um, about this appeal for the variance. So if it's with the board, I'll just read that. Is that appropriate? Um, certainly. It says, as a resident of 921 Shore Road, Cape Elizabeth, lot number 60 of tax map U04, my property directly abuts the Vandis property at 905 Shore Road. The Vandis family has approached me regarding their recent application for a left side property line variance to construct a detached garage at 16 feet, 0 inches from our shared property line. I do not object to the pursuit of this variance as the new building at the reduced setback will have little negative impact on the use of my property. Thank you for your time. Sincerely, Martha M. Kearney. Thank you. Um, the, I share um, ownership of this house with my parents. It's a house that they plan to uh, retire to in the next few years. Um, there is no existing garage at this time, and they desire to have a garage built, a two-car garage. My father does a lot of hobbies. He's a woodworker in his spare time, and he does a lot of uh, metalworking. So you want to have a shop space as well. In the uh, basement of the house, it has uneven floors and very short ceilings since it's such an old vintage. And so the garage would also house a workspace in the back. Um, with where the present location of the house is um, and where the driveway is, putting the garage ahead of the driveway with the size that my father wishes to construct puts if you're looking at the garage, the right rear corner into uh, exposed bed bedrock. And there's some that's below ground, but there's a, definitely a rise in the ground. And there are several uh, maple trees that are behind where that corner will go as well that the excavator um, declared would, be, would have to be destroyed or taken down for the work to be done in the garage. Uh, there's little trees on the rest of the property, and the house receives a little shade, and those trees are what shade the house receives. So um, in trying to preserve the trees and preventing from having to blast the bedrock, uh, we request the four foot variance to uh, reduce the setback to 16 feet. Anything else? Um, I, don't, I don't know what's appropriate. I don't know if you want me to read through the application. I don't uh, no, you don't need to read through the application. We all have that. Um, and um, I have to assume that all the board members have, have read it. I think it's fair for you to assume that also, but, but thank you. Um, do any of the board members have questions for Mr. Vendis? Are the neighbors whose endorsement you've just read to us aware of your father's interest as hobbies, that it's going to be used in addition to a garage, it's going to be used as a workshop? Which yes, through casual conversation, I don't, I don't know if they would remember that. I mean, it's something that has been discussed, but not in a very formal setting, no. Is it your thought that some of the noise might be excessive and, and bothersome to them? Um, no, it's not chainsawing. It's not you know, high-speed tools. He has a small metal lathe. He has a small mill. Um, his shop right now is where he lives in Ann Arbor is in the basement of a split-level house. It doesn't, there's no extra insulation to prevent the noise from going through the rest of the home. So I would say no. Okay, thank you. Can you uh, enlighten me on your, uh, no other feasible alternatives to a variance is available to the petitioner. Now you say that the only alternative to the variance would be to shrink the size of the garage to fit the under, 
the, the, uh, to size underfitting the intended purpose or or dynamite the rock ledge and destroy maple trees. Now, you don't consider that an alternative? I'm sorry, the dynamiting? Yeah, the or and destroying, take, cutting down the maple trees. Um, I guess in specific terms, it could be an alternative. It's not an alternative that we seek. Um, doing the blasting and removing those shade trees. Could the garage be moved closer to Shore Road and closer to the house, avoiding both the ledge and the trees? Um, yes, it could. And that falls into a bit of a realm of an aesthetic issue. There are, in that back room of the house, is a, kind of a dining room. Bringing the garage closer to the house and forward towards Shore Road puts the garage in those windows, um, reducing kind of the green views and um, the feel, feel of the room. And that is an aesthetic. Um, there's no, uh, that's the, uh, it's not really a hardship, but that it's based on aesthetic more than anything else. Thank you. I assume that that would also reduce the value of the house if the windows were looking out at a, at a blank wall. That would be... Yeah, kind of the big, yeah, cedar shake wall. <laughs> yes. Mr. Fristasi. <laughs> Hello again. <laughs> um, this is the first one we've had under the practical difficulty, unless I was out. Yes, Mr. Van Dissel, you, you should get some kind of recognition for this as being the first person to come before us. I, I, I guess the first question is, yeah, how, how long did you wait before, <laughs> before coming to us? If you had come to us last month mm -hmm. uh, under the hardship, uh, I would probably say you'd see six thumbs down on this. Yes. Uh, only because blasting and cutting trees down does not constitute a hardship. But in reading the, the requirements over, uh, it seems to me that you're a prime candidate to get the variance this evening uh, because of the unique character of the neighborhood and the, the practical difficulty and, and uh, uh, the variance would not unreasonably adversely affect the natural environment. It sounds like you're trying to, trying to preserve it. Uh, Bob asked a question about moving it forward and, and you gave the answer that I like to hear. So uh, I got to compliment you uh, on your presentation and, and addressing the, the, uh, the five requirements under the practical difficulty. Other questions? <clears throat> Mr. Van Dess, uh, regarding feasible, other feasible alternatives, mm -hmm. have you explored the possibility of reconfiguring the rear eight-foot workshop that is going to be used by your father in the sense that by moving the garage to the north four feet to conform to the setback, the rear eight foot by 20 foot area you state is going to be used for woodworking and metalwork and shop. Mm -hmm. Could this be reconfigured uh, according to your diagram where you show the trees and the ledge? Mm -hmm. Also, I drove by your property and, and saw the ledge that you described. Uh, that seems to be one feasible alternative, not affecting the garage but for just automobile the purposes, but the rear eight foot. Is this a possibility that you could split the difference somewhat, move um, it a bit closer to the house, still have the floor space for the woodworking shop, or the workshop in the rear, and, and meet the size requirements in a reconfigured situation? And second question, have you explored blasting of ledge. Ledge in this area is, is, in all of Cape Elizabeth, is quite prevalent throughout. Blasting is un undertaken as needed and in situations relatively close to the house without jeopardizing the house. Mm -hmm. Have you looked into this? No, we have not. Um, we just received the original bid from the excavator who's going to pour the foundation, and he gave an anecdotal, it'll be a lot more if I have to do blasting. Um, that tied with 
with the new addition that was put on, being so close to the ledge, um, my father was resistant to following that course of action with the possibility of getting an appeal and a variance on the setback. Um, and then to, does that answer your question? Or, and then back to the, the first question you had about the, a different configuration. Um, the space is eight feet by 24 feet. It's a very narrow space. And my father was trying to get, maximize that as much as possible by having that 24 feet of length of wall for the eight feet. Um, the other thing, and it, there's not a plot plan of the garage on that drawing, but it's all of a square. And I don't, my immediate thought of your question is to maybe take out a corner of the garage or something to that effect for the shop space. Um, and I don't know what that does to the cost of the building. As it exists now, it's a very, it's a simple square with trusses for, uh, for the roof. And I don't know what's involved with changing the shape of that. And that is not something we have looked into. And also, what do you think that noise will be a factor with the woodworking and metalworking in view of the reduced setback? Is this a concern or consideration? Uh, surely it's a consideration, but I do not feel it's a concern. Other questions for Mr. Van Dis? Can I just add one thing? That you may. Uh, my father does not tend to use, does, or does not use a dust collector, and those are like that tends to be one of the pieces of equipment that generates a lot of noise. He's, this is definitely hobby based, and so there that is not part of the plan for the garage. Those loud, constantly drumming pieces of equipment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else here to speak in favor of Mr. Vendis's application? And I see no one here opposed. Thank you, Mr. Vendis. Thank you. Um, that will close the public comment uh, portion of the hearing. Uh, discussion by the board. I think that it stating the obvious, um, under the undue hardship, this probably would be one of those that we would be denying, as Mr. Prashtashi said. But the town council has now given us a new variant standard to consider things, which is practical difficulty, based on the fact that Cape Elizabeth residents wanted to be able to get variances easier to do what they would like to at the property. And I think this falls in that category nicely. He's done a good job at explaining why he meets the practical difficulty standard. And I think that this is a variance that we should approve. Yeah, I don't think he qualifies under the no feasible alternatives variance. His argument basically, in fact, he recognizes there are feasible, there are alternatives, and which are feasible, maybe expensive, but it's, but it, but feasible. Uh, I'm sensitive to Jay's point about, well, there's the garage and then there's a workshop. Uh, the question is, is there are other places to put a workshop? And I, a couple of weeks ago, months ago, we, we denied somebody a variance because his argument basically on, on, on aesthetics. So the idea of moving the garage closer to the house and meeting the setbacks, he said was an aesthetic consideration. And therefore, uh, is, the argument seems to be that, that that's not feasible because it interferes with the aesthetics of the house. So I don't think he, it qualifies, I think it fails on, under section D, to my mind. Other comments? By his site plan, it doesn't really appear that the garage can be moved to the right um, on the lot, bringing the garage into compliance uh, with the setback due to the fact that the ledge is there. It, it would, when I initially looked at the picture, I thought, geez, wouldn't it be nice to line it up with the, uh, the, the end of the driveway so it would match up? But it brings it too close to the exposed ledge, bringing up the hardship of 
um, possibly damaging the recent uh, damaging the recent addition and the added site work which would have to be done to uh, to put in the footings for that garage. So it doesn't seem like moving it to the to the right is a is a really practical application or a feasible alternative. It, it seems like the garage is best placed where it is on the site plan. It, Mr. Fristasi, this is one place where I really would like to hear, <laughs> not that I don't always like to hear, but I'd really like to hear your comments on the ledge issue as whether it's uh, feasible. Initially when I received the packet, I too had a concern about the placement of the garage on the lot uh, based on the um, plot plan that was so graphically presented to us by the applicant. And I appreciate this, the expense that you went to and uh, to determine the, um, the property line on the side. I did a drive by and I saw the flags. Basically I located where the garage was going to go and I saw the ledge and the, the shade trees. Also determined that uh, in moving the garage forward closer to the, the addition to avoid both the ledge and the, the, uh, uh, the 20 foot setback, it appeared as though he'd be shading the house. Um, and um, the house is located on the, on the northerly side of the lot where the garage would be placed on the southerly side. Um, one of the main concerns when you place a house on a lot is to maximize the exposure, uh, the sun. And I think that if moving the, the garage forward to avoid the 20-foot um, uh, setback and to avoid the ledge, I think it would place a, uh, a shade, shade the house uh, year-round, place um, too much darkness in it. Uh, and uh, I was satisfied after I did a site, uh, a site walk or, or a drive-by that in moving the garage forward or any, any other place that it would affect the, uh, uh, the light in the house itself. Uh, it was a concern that I had, Bob and Jay, um, and uh, I'm satisfied that the placement of it, you've got a letter from the abutter saying it's not a problem to them uh, there's uh, 40 feet between this garage and the, and the existing garage of the neighbor. So, I mean, normally I'm concerned about those things, but uh, in this case, I, I endorse the plan. I don't have a problem with what he's doing and what he, what he tried to do. Do you think as a construction that, the, that, that there is no practical, no feasible alternative? Well, to blast the ledge, you might get it closer. You might get it closer to the ledge in the shade tree, uh, raise it up. You, you can avoid the... Um, um, the, the ledge itself, but in, in the future years, the roots from the trees, those maple trees, and they, the roots do, you know, they're shallow roots, they might come in and break the concrete in the garage. So, I mean, that's a concern that the, the, um, the applicant should have. Um, again, Bob, you know me, I've been on the board a long time. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I accept your yeah. opinion as an and expert, I, and I, that, that there isn't really a practical well, difficulty. Well, I'm there. comfortable that he's done his best to, to avoid the ledge and, and basically to, to keep sunlight in the, in the house. Mm -hmm. um, it was a concern that I had when I originally received the packet, as I said. But uh, I think that he's doing the best, and, and he's talking to a professional excavator mm -hmm. who's, who's placing this. Someone took the time to stake it out. Was that... Uh, the excavator is that uh, Delarius? Okay. So I mean, I, I think that they they recognize that this board is is not uh, too free with their their uh, variances. So I mean, I, I don't have a problem with the four foot setback myself. Is there an issue with the with the most garages are twenty feet deep? Are they? That see that was the question that was brought up. Uh, I think in reducing. Uh, I mean, he's gone 28 deep. If he went 28 wide, that would further uh, uh, encroach on, on, the, on the setback. Uh, I think he's done, you know, what he should do, and that's to minimize the, the encroachment. Looking at the, at the design of the garage itself, I mean, this isn't the, the cheap way to build a garage. Uh, you've gone 28 with the, I'm trying to find, find the map, 28 with the, uh, yeah. 28 foot trusses, uh, he could have gone 24 foot trusses. Yes. And, and uh, you know, he's, he's, he's not do, trying to get out of it the least expensive way. So he's spending more money by, by going with a 28 foot truss as opposed to a 24 foot truss. So, I mean, I think he's done his best to, to, uh, uh, to avoid 
coming before us. But um, I think if you go with a 20-foot 20, 20 garage, uh, it really would be minimizing the effectiveness of a garage. I mean, you can't really put too much into a garage itself, you know, 20 foot deep. In an effort to uphold the ordinance, I would have liked to have seen more investigation into the feasible alternative. Uh, I think the garage plan is, is uh, acceptable. I, I think the concept is acceptable. But I, it does appear to me that there are alternatives that would satisfy your needs, your father's need, your garage space and workshop space, and still conform to the ordinances. Uh, I don't know that blasting of ledge in this area is such an issue from a structural standpoint. Uh, it would be a bit of an additional cost, but in an effort to observe the ordinance, which states there are other alternatives or that there are no other alternatives, it appears to me that, that there are although a bit more costly, and it's my feeling that this could be investigated further. That and the possible rearrangement of the configuration of the garage. These two issues both seem to be possibilities that would solve your floor space as well as meet the ordinance. Other discussion? Um, I think what I'd like to do is what we have done in the past, and that is go down each of the six different findings and ask for a vote on each of the findings um, that are required. Um, I think there are actually, although there are six enumerated findings, I think there's a seventh one, and that is the practical difficulty finding itself. In other words, I, the way I read this, we have to find one, that there is a practical difficulty and that six other conditions exist. Since this is our first time through this and under this standard, do the uh, other board members agree with me that that's the right way to proceed here? Does the seventh one come at the beginning or the end? Well, I think it comes at the beginning. Um, the statute says uh, to grant variances from the terms of this ordinance, um, well, I have to back up a little bit, but it, what it's saying is that this board has the power, the authority to grant variances from the terms of this ordinance provided that, one, there is no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance, and two, a literal enforcement of the ordinance would cause a practical difficulty as defined by 30-A MRSA section 4353-4-C. Variance from dimensional standards um, and when the following conditions exist. So maybe there are actually eight. We need to find one, that there's no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance. Two, um, that a literal enforcement of the ordinance would cause a practical difficulty as defined by the relevant state statute. And then we also need to find that six conditions exist. Doesn't practical difficulty part of C? Part of C? Correct. I agree. Where's the well, actually, I, what I'm saying now is that maybe there are eight. Okay. <laughs> what was the seven? Well. I know that there's one more after seven, but what was the seven? Let's move one through six down to three through eight, and we're going to put two new ones in front of the first six. Well, one, that there is no substantial departure from the intent of the ordinance. 
in granting the variance, um, and two, that a literal enforcement of the ordinance would cause a practical difficulty. Do, do you not agree no. that we need to go through those? Do you think we merely need to find the six conclusions, and if we find those, then by definition a practical difficulty exists? Yeah, I think that in the spirit of the ordinance, the first one, the intent of the ordinance, I think everything we do has to be with the intent of the ordinance, and I think that's, that's just extra wording that the statute has. I don't think that that's, that's making us do anything additional. We have to keep the ordinance in mind at all times. And then second, I think part of would cause a practical difficulty, the second line that you proposed, is kind of encompassed in C, which I don't know what number that would be now, but I think in part of the practical difficulty analysis that we would have under the, the third test, that is incorporated by definition of the word, what is practical difficulty as definition means. And I think that incorporates what you propose to have the second test, which is whether it would cause practical I think the practical difficulty not being result of the owner, I think keeping that in mind is the practical difficulty based on the, the definition. Similar to the undue hardship statute. We didn't have two undue hardship, whether the undue hardship was a, whether there was an undue hardship, whether it was a cause of undue hardship, and whether the undue hardship was a cause of the actions of the owner. I think we're separating it out and making it difficult, more difficult for the applicant to satisfy these. Well, I think the first thing, though, is, uh, is there a practical difficulty? Is being without a garage and a, work, a garage workshop combination a practical difficulty? Well, uh, you know, it's not like being without plumbing. It's not like being without, uh, without a roof over your head. It's not like being without uh, uh, adequate living space. I, I'm reading the statute, though, that the statute will be granted if it, the, the variance will be granted if it causes a practical, strict interpretation causes a practical difficulty. The statute then goes on to explain a variance should be granted when these exist. It, I'm interpreting the statute to say practical difficulty is the standard, and that exists when these six A through F elements are tested or applied. If the statute doesn't read, it would cause practical difficulty as defined, comma, number three, and the following conditions exist. Well, let me ask yes, I think it does. I think that's exactly the way it reads. I mean, if a person wanted to build a, a greenhouse, you would say, would you, you immediately go to here, would you say, not having a greenhouse is a practical difficulty? Ms. Miller, do you have a copy of the statute? Yeah, I've got it right here. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know whether you were reading from the findings no, of fact I, and I, conclusions. But I see par sentence one as the, the, the standard, or the, the rule in essence, and then number the second sentence as defining how that would be applied. So I don't see them as being, if it was number one, that there's no departure, and that literal enforcement would be a practical difficulty, and third, that these following conditions exist, and then I would agree that we apply numeral extra steps, but because it's just step one and step two in the first sentence, and then the third, the st there's only two steps in the first sentence, and then the second step sentence seems to define that more closely. I think we are, we're doing, we're in effect applying a standard that's not there, or an, we're making it an extra step. Well, if you read the definition of practical difficulty, an occasion where the strict application of the ordinance for property precludes the ability of the property owners to pursue a use permitted in the zoning district in which the property is located and results in significant economic injury to the property owner. And I agree. And I think that to determine So we have to measure, determine that. No, well, I, no, I don't. I think in to determine that, what we're doing is applying these six steps, and these six steps are determining whether there's a practical difficulty. That's correct. The, the language for the practical difficulty in the first paragraph that you want to, that the chair wants to include as part of the, is, is no different than what was in the book before. That there is no substantial departure from the intent of the audience and a little enforcement of the audience would cause undue hardship. The only two words to change is practical difficulty and, and that never has been something 
the undue hardship questions, if they're met, goes back to proving that those, those conditions are in place. Well, the difference, the reason why I take issue with that is the old ordinance says the term undue hardship as used in this set, well, first of all, we had to find that a literal enforcement would cause an undue hardship. Then it went on to say the term undue hardship as used in this section means one, two, three, and four. In this case, it says that we have to find, I read it to say that first we have to find that there's a practical difficulty, and it doesn't define practical difficulty, at least not in this section. It does elsewhere in the definitions. Then it goes on to say, not only do we have to find practical difficulty, and we have to find that the following conditions exist. I disagree with that and. I don't know where that is. It is right there. No, but I don't see it as that, that's, I don't see it as applying to the practical difficulty. Practical difficulty as defined is entirely, is entirely different from A through F. I see A through F being the, the test if there's a practical difficulty. That if you meet A through F, then by definition you've exactly. defined practical yeah. difficulty? And I see, and so in essence what I'm saying, Dave, is if I, if you add, just for the sake of making it clear, G is, I, I, let's not argue where we're going to place it in our test, but sure. if we make a G, we're in essence rewriting the statute. And if, assuming G, we're on the same page, is G is, if, is there a practical difficulty? That's not, I, I think that all of these, the totality of A through F is, is there a practical difficulty? And separating them out, I think, in essence, is rewriting what the, le the legislature has given us, well, making it harder. Regardless of whether they're incorporated, I think that we just shouldn't be adding steps to A through F. But practical difficulty is a defined yeah, term. Yeah, where are you, where are you, where, yeah, where are you picking up the definition of, of practical difficulty in, in the, the analysis? In the definition section. Look on page one, it's, it's a defined term. Right, and I understand that. It's not, it is a defined term, so, it's not a test. The de definition doesn't give us a test, it gives us a definition to help us understand it. But, and that is made, I think, We've defined it in our, in our ordinance, but the statute doesn't have that right. test. Right, it doesn't. That's the test whether or not the practical difficulty meets the, the standards for, uh, for a variance. But first you have to recognize the practical difficulty exists, and then you see if these four or six standards apply to it. If there is no economic loss, or if it's an economic, significant economic injury is defined, for instance, in no cases fewer than 10 of the nearest property owners have to uh, have, have, say, have garages, that's a test that must be met before you can see if the other criteria will apply. And I, I raised the question if somebody wanted to build a greenhouse or somebody wants to build, in one case, somebody wanted to build a uh, barn to raise Shetland ponies. Uh, I mean, that's not practical difficulty to my mind. Uh, this goes back a few years. So. Well, I think if we're starting to apply it, now, now we're getting it even harder and you're starting to now apply the standard that we're trying to define. So I think, right. I think if you stay clear of examples right now, it probably makes this easier. Yeah. I think the practical difficulty is, the legislature has enacted the practical difficulty stack, which we have here. In, in further, I don't know if it was necessary or not, but the, our council in adopting this has also enacted their own definition, which we're looking at here. And this isn't the state main statute, this is the ordinance. I don't think we, we, whether or not we needed to do that isn't my job tonight. My job is just to interpret the main statute. And I think to do that, it's saying the practical difficulty is the standard and these are the, the tests to determine if there is a practical difficulty. And I no, it's determined if, if the practical difficulty is entitled to a variance. Lots of people practical difficulties. No, right. I, yeah. I can build a 50 foot house okay. at the practical no. difficulty. But. But Mr. Cronin, uh, there's also a sentence in the definition of practical difficulty, and it states um, the ability of the property, property owner to pursue a use permitted in right. the zoning district in which the property is right. located, right. and the construction of a garage, were he not needing a, a variance to the setback, yeah. would be a permitted use. Yeah, and, and we have to find that, but that, and you have, to, and this business about ten, the ten adjacent property, uh, where economic injury is defined. Uh, may, let me read it. Placing the, placing the applicant 
uh, for a variance at a disadvantage in the neighborhood by applying zoning ordinance standards, which would prevent the applicant from having a structure or accessory compatible with the neighborhood, location and number, uh, compatible in size, location and number to those of other property owners in the immediate neighborhood, but in no cases fewer than 10 of the nearest property owners. So if those, if nobody in that neighborhood had garages, then there would be a practical difficulty, and whether or not those criteria applied would be irrelevant. However, the, the garage is uh, a use permitted in that zoning district, and the significant economic injury yeah, and that has could be, well, the, the significant economic injury could be a result of forcing him to place the garage, as we talked about, closer to the home sure, or the sure. blasting of the ledge. I, I agree with that. The question I think for us is do we have to find that there's a practical difficulty first? And I think that that's, that's reasonable because none of these, the variance is from, a variance from uh, having a practical difficulty. They don't define a practical difficulty. Practical difficulty exists independent of these criteria. The, the uh, uh, justification for a variance is defined by, by these six criteria. But are you in agreement that using A through F are the, are, the, uh, are the language that you should be using to define practical difficulty? No, practical difficulty is a defined term. See, I see this as really being the same test and the same analysis as it was under the undue hardship. Under the un old variance, it said, um, ordinances shall be granted if it will be an undue hardship, da -da -da -da, un as defined. So we're saying undue hardship, and then we're saying it's defined by our zoning ordinance. It right. continues by saying the undue hardship shall mean, and then these four tests, or, yeah. yeah, four things. No, no, that's, uh, undue hardship is, you know, is that. The, the variance, the relief of the hardship has to meet those criteria. That's not the hardship. I mean, people have come before this board that I don't have a greenhouse, that's a hardship. I don't have a, a barn, that's a hardship. I, I don't have a no, six-car no, garage, no. that's a hardship. So you have, first you have to find that a hardship exists. Similarly, you have to find that a practical difficulty exists, and then see if it okay. meets the criteria for relief. This okay. is the criteria for relief. This is not the hardship. Okay, Joe, and you, with your experience, when you had the, did you have the one, the undue hardship as a test to begin with, and then two, that it can't reuse a reasonable return, and then three? Yeah, you had to go through the four, and you had to get uh, um, affirmative action on all four. Okay, but my question is, was it four or was it five? There were four. Okay, what we're doing is similarly. I think we're trying, instead of having six, we're trying to make it seven, and I think that the totality of the four equaled whether or not there was an undue hardship to give you a variance. And what I'm saying just tonight, I'm sorry if this is way off. No, go ahead, that's fine. I think that the six we're supposed to answer equals whether there's practical difficulty, as it did with the four equaling an undue hardship. I agree. I, I, I would agree with you if the undue hardship ordinance was written in the same format as the undue I, I, I if practical difficulty was written as the same, undue hard, the undue hardship ordinance said the term undue hardship shall mean one, two, three, four. This doesn't say practical difficulty means A through F. It says you have to meet practical difficulty and Joe, these you? conditions. My experience has been not only in, in Cape Elizabeth but in other zoning boards that I attended that have previously adopted the um, undue hardship standards, they have, they have, some have five, practical difficulty, they had five standards, and they were spelled out. Oh, that's less. <laughs> okay, that was less. We have, we have six, and it's my understanding that you go by the six, and then you come to your conclusion. That's been my understanding going before other zoning boards. Uh, it's been my understanding uh, of, uh, you know, the interpretation of the ordinance not only in Cape Elizabeth, but in other, other communities, uh, that you go by the, the, the four or five or whatever it might be, and then the total is, is your answer. If, if one doesn't meet the criteria, then it's... Then there's no practical difficulty. Then there's no practical difficulty. Exactly. Just like we had previously. Right. But also, it's my understanding, and we've talked, what, about half an hour on this, that the purpose of this is to relax the standard to give people an opportunity to do something they wouldn't have the opportunity to do in the past. And, and what I'm hearing in this conversation is it's becoming more and more difficult to give someone an opportunity to build a garage or an addition or a deck. 
And I don't think that that was the intent of, of this, this ordinance. It's, it's to relax it so people would have an opportunity to expand and, and to meet the definition of, of, uh, uh, of the zoning ordinance or the purpose. And the purpose of this ordinance is to promote health, safety, and general welfare of the residents of Cape Elizabeth. And that's why I ran to To encourage the most appropriate use of land throughout the town. And if this individual wants a garage, God bless him. Give him a garage. Well, Joe, there's no question that this was intended to relax the standards. Whereas before we had to find that there was the loss of all beneficial, the practical loss of all beneficial use of the property, now we only have to find significant economic injury. We don't have to find all loss. In this particular case, I mean, we're talking about practical difficulty, and, and I'm thinking we're talking about the specific case. Uh, at least it's come up a couple of times. This individual hired a professional surveyor to place the house knowing full. I mean, this person's been, been before us, so this is the surveyor, to place the house to avoid coming before us, but they, they weren't able to do it. And that's why he's here. He's, he's done the best possible job. There is no other feasible alternative for him. And blasting is not cheap. Even if you do blast, you know, you're still not solving the whole problem. So, I mean, he's, he's, he's trying to get out of this without spending a lot of money, but I don't think, I mean, I, I think he's, he's met it just by hiring the professionals that he, that he has. Um, is it the consensus of the board that we only need to meet A through F? Yes. No. <laughs> and then the general vote. I hear three yeses. I hear a no down there. Here and no there. I think I'm on the no side, but here's my suggestion for tonight. I'd suggest we go with A through F. We don't have any dissenters, any objectors here. I'd suggest we go with A through F uh, for this evening. Um, and after tonight, we ask Michael Hill uh, to give us an opinion as to whether in addressing the practical difficulty standard, we need to make findings on A through F, or whether we first need to find practical difficulty and then go A through F. Does that seem reasonable to do? That seems good. Um, sure. It, would it be appropriate for us to ask Bruce Smith what his thoughts are, or because he, that was putting him in an advisory position? That well, it, it, no, I think it's okay, and I think Bruce has already told us. Yeah. I think he thinks it's A through F, and we don't need to separately find practical difficulty. Is that correct, that's, Bruce? That's, I, that's my opinion. Um, and I think even tonight, for the sake of making peace, and I don't want to be the out there one. Um, I think I, I know I'm which way I'm leaning, and I would agree. I'm going to be voting for this variance, regardless whether I have six or 27 tests. So I think we could make amends tonight, and we'll go your way, or I'm not speaking for everyone, but I think that there'd be a consensus there. If I may, if I may make a comment, we're, we're talking to A through F. I took the liberty of, of eliminating F, the property is not located in whole or in part within shoreland areas because the applicant wouldn't come to the board into this matter uh, if he was in shoreland zone. So it's understood if the application is before you that, that it's not in the shoreland zone. If that's okay with the board, then I'll continue. Otherwise, I can put that question on and have him answer it. But I thought it was a predetermined situation bef before he could even come to the board. For the purposes of um, future variance request, does it make any sense for us to apply this more strict test tonight so that other applicants down the road can't say that we gave an easier one tonight and then decided later it'd be hard? Depends on what the outcome is. If you imply them and the outcome was negative, then well, maybe that's more strict if the determination is the other way. No, I think that for the purposes of tonight, I think we could take a preliminary assessment, but I'm, I'm saying for applicants down the road, if they say on this night you, you, you applied the easier test and you granted it, and now you're applying me a harder test for me, I'm, I'm just kind of putting it out there for the board to say maybe we should then apply the harder standard tonight, even it, because it's, it's, I can't speak for everybody, but if it, it looks like he's going to be granted it, it really doesn't make any difference to him if we apply the harder or the, the lesser well, bear in mind we have another applicant uh, to follow under the same standard this evening. That's true. Okay. As the chair okay. noted earlier, based on the lack of opposition to the product from the abutters, uh, the easier standard might be the more practical route to follow okay. in this Which case. I forgot about that. You're right. 
Um, so, in my previous suggestion stands, I guess, and that is that we go with A through F and not separately find practical difficulty. Now, for those in the audience uh, who have an interest in what we're doing here, there's an old saying that there are two things you should never see made, laws and sausage. And you're in the process of seeing a struggle through the making of law here. Um, it's not a pretty picture, but the end result usually is, is fairly efficient, so. I think if they all fall asleep, though, they won't have to see much. Okay, we'll have So, are there, are there any objections to proceeding? as I've suggested for this evening? Uh, just one well, objection, but a question. Uh, so if I vote on three, yes or no, I recognize there is a practical difficulty. Because it says practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by a prior, prior owner. If I say yes, then I'm recognized there is a practical difficulty, and if I know I'm recognized there is a practical difficulty. It's like saying, you know, has this man stopped beating his wife? Yes or no? But it, that assumes that, that he was beating his wife, no matter what happens. So it makes it difficult to vote on it. I agree with you. And we had the same problem yeah. last, week, last month under undue hardship. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I agree with what Mr. Cronin is saying. I, I, but I, I think, again, just reiterating my point, I'll be done with that, is there isn't one test for the practical difficulty. There are six tests to determine if there's a practical difficulty. So I disagree with Mr. Cronin in the sense no, that three is the practical can difficulty. Can I ask how you address things? that the, cr the criteria are a criteria for a variance from the setback due to practical difficulty. That you can have a practical difficulty yet not meet these things. Do you recognize yeah, that? that? That's a larger concern that we can't change because we're stuck with our... Oh, I'm saying... I understand. No, but, but I'm not interpreting... You're defining these conclusions as defining a practical difficulty. And I'm saying those are the criteria for a variance given a practical difficulty. But unfortunately, we can't change that. That's what it, I mean. Yeah, I understand. Right. I understand. That it's a defined term. I, I, I guess I, we're, we've come to a standstill here. Okay. But we can go on. Well, in that case, um, I'd like to go through A through F uh, by a show of hands with a vote as to whether the applicant has um, met each of the conditions under. Um, a through F. So you the first one, one. You mean one through six? Um, on yes, one through six. I'm sorry. I'm looking at the ordinance. Uh, let me pull out the conclu the findings and conclusions. Um, let's look, I'm looking now at the conclusions. Um, so um, may I, by a show of hands, um, ask how many board members believe that the applicant um, has established that the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. Um, uh, Shore Road is, is a very rocky neighborhood with lots of ledge on it. So I don't think he meets that criteria. Um, and did I see a hand here? Okay, so that um, five one. is met by a vote of five to one. Um, how many members of the board believe the applicant um, has um, satisfied um, a showing that condition number two exists, and that is that the granting of the variance uh, will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not unreasonably detrimentally affect the use or market value of abutting properties? Um, five to one uh, again. Oh, I'm, I'm again. So we have oh. an opposed, uh, five to one. Um, and how many board members believe that the applicant has satisfied um, condition number three by establishing that the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or by a prior owner? Um, that is six to zero. Um, and by a show of hands, how many board members believe that the applicant has established um, criteria number four, that no other feasible alternative to a variance uh, is available uh, to the petitioner? Um, opposed? Uh, four to two. 
and by show of hands, uh, and I, I guess this is just established as a matter of fact, that the property um, isn't, we, well, we should find this anyway, um, as to whether the property is not located. How many members of the board believe that there has been a showing that the property is not located in whole or in part within shoreland areas as described in Title 38, Section 435? You skipped number five. Oh, I'm sorry. I did, I did skip one. Uh, back to number five. Um, by show of hands, uh, how many members of the board believe that the applicant has established that the granting of the variance will not unreasonably adversely affect natural, the natural environment? Uh, six to zero. And the last one again, um, a finding that the property is not located in whole or in part within shoreland areas as described in Title 38, Section 435. And that is met six to zero. Now, with those uh, findings, may I hear a motion from someone on the application? I'll make a motion, David, um, that we grant the applicant the variance to construct a garage 16 feet from the property line, left property line, based on the finding of facts and conclusions established this evening. Could you restate that, please? Could you restate that, please? Could you restate it? Sure. I make a motion to grant the applicant a variance, a 16-foot, excuse me, a 4-foot variance on the left side of the property line to construct a garage based on the finding of facts and conclusions that we've established this evening. <coughs> Do I hear a second? A second. Point of information, does that preclude the workshop? Well, that's the garage and whatever else is included in the garage. I, okay. that Most garages. states a workshop and the applicant has not demonstrated that uh, garage workshops uh, I feel confident that there are 10 garages, that the 10 nearest property owners have garages. Uh, he has not established that the 10 nearest property owners have garages with workshops in them. Well, I, I don't think that it's the, uh, the board's uh, 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 within their power to restrict what they do in that garage. And if he's going to have a hobby and a workshop or whatever, fine. Um, I'm not going to place a limitation, and in the past I've endorsed something or encouraged something, and I got my, my wrist slapped when we were talking about a daycare a few years ago. So, I mean, I'm, I'm talking, um, and if you'd like me to amend the motion, it's, it's to grant the variance as presented this evening, 16 feet from the left property setback. Is that really a necessary Part oh, of it. Know, if, I, if they get the variance, the significant economic injury as a defined term, and most garages are, are what, 24 by 22, Bruce? 24 by 20. There, all, all kinds of different sizes. There's no real standard. 24 by 24. What? 24 by 24 is a standard garage to okay. house cars, but I guess I won't belabor the point. Discussion on the motion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Opposed? The motion passes four to two, and the application is granted. Um. May I make a comment uh, to the chair on this, this past applicant, the ap past application? Uh, I feel very strongly that the presentation of material, more specifically the survey uh, presented to us, carried a lot of weight on my decision that he hired someone, spent the time and money to basically pre present a professional engineer's determination as to the best, best location for the garage. And I, I have to applaud the applicant for spending the money and the time in doing that. Um, we've had others come before us and there's been questions 
and it makes it a lot easier for us to grant a variance when this information is presented to us. Thank you, Mr. Bendis. You're welcome to stay. You're also welcome to leave. Well, the next item on our agenda is to hear the variance appeal of Cameron and Leslie Brown, uh, for Macaulay Road, tax map U49, lot 22, for a left side property line variance of 8 feet 0 inches from the required 20 feet 0 inches to construct a second floor addition to the existing garage at 12 feet from said property. Do we have someone here in support of this application? Please state your name and address for the record. Uh, Cameron Brown, for Macaulay Road. Um, I guess I don't think I hired a professional engineer, Joe, but I'll do the best I can. Um, what we did was um, I put together a little package for you and showed you where the uh, side setback is. Uh, there's an existing garage there. Um, with the 12 foot setback that was granted back in 1980, uh, 1986. And uh, to make this quick and concise, what we want to do is we have a growing family. We have uh, really two bedrooms and we've got four kids. So uh, we desperately need a, uh, two more bedrooms and a bath. Um, and what we want to do is add a second floor and use the existing garage uh, as a living room and add straight above it uh, a, a two bedrooms and a bath, and there would be no additional uh, building either to the left or the right or front or back. Um, if you look in my little package, uh, I show a picture of the existing house where um, there's, a, there's a garage and, a, and an entryway, and uh, the next picture shows, I put an overlay of what it would look like with the addition. And uh, according to my, my judgment and the letters that I received from my neighbors, uh, my two side neighbors and two in front, that they looked at this, we discussed it, and uh, they agreed with it that it, went, it conformed to the existing neighborhood. It didn't uh, affect their privacy, nor did it uh, 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 hurt their uh, their, um, their, ex their, what do I want to say, their, um, their housing. Um, so the next page, what I did was I, I, there's a picture of the existing lot in our closest neighbor. Um, the, between the two garages is 31 feet. And um, you can see if you add this, uh, the second floor to it, because we're down in a gully, um, and they're sort of looking above us. The, uh, the additional 20, total of 23 feet would only add four more feet to what they, to our, to our neighbors, to, uh, to the right of us. Um, again, I, I mentioned this to our neighbors and they looked at it and they didn't see any uh, effect that it would have on their, uh, on their privacy or um, would it uh, reduce the, uh, uh, their housing, uh, what I want to say, the value of their house or the neighborhood. Uh, I, like I said, I did get, um, I did get, uh, did talk to our neighbors, and in the front, you'll see that uh, I did get, I did get letters from them agreeing that uh, they had no problems with it. And as you can see, um, there, there's no opposition here. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I want to be. Uh, fair with this and I want, I'm going to be living in the neighborhood for a while, I don't want uh, uh, any neighbors uh, disappointed with the addition. The, uh, the other alternatives we had uh, was to either go build in front or in back. If we built in front, uh, you know, I think it would look like a L-shaped mobile home, to tell you the truth. Um, also, it would, it would definitely affect the view of our neighbor to our right of us of, of the street. 
we'd have to build it 24 feet out. It would come out and uh, the neighbor to the, to the right of us, once he gets out of his house, it would, it would block his view, you know, his front view. Uh, if we built behind us, again, it would, it would uh, reduce his privacy because he has a deck behind. And we'd, if we built that way, we'd be, uh, it'd be a living room space. It'd be a lot of, uh, there'd be a, you know, a couple windows and so forth. And he would have to sit out back of his uh, deck and he would basically see a couple windows along with, it would reduce his view of his backyard and the woods along with, um, it would, he would be looking at, uh, you know, a 20 foot length um, wall with a couple windows. So I really thought uh, that wouldn't be the best alternative. So our most economical best alternative was to use the existing garage as it stands and just build straight up. Anything else? No, that's it. Okay. Um, thank you. Questions for Mr. Brown? Uh, Mr. Brown, have you uh, given consideration to expanding in other areas such as above the primary house? Above the primary house, yes, uh, we did originally, but it's, it's a lot more expensive. In Plus, if you, if you went straight up, if you looked at the picture, if you, looked, if you go straight up above the existing house, your, your roof lines, would, it would look kind of silly. We'd, then we, what we'd have to do is we'd have to expand to make it conform with the, with the roof line. Um, we'd have to add an extra second floor to the, to the uh, existing garage. That leads to my next question. In the in your proposal, you are eliminating your garage. Yes. Do you foresee in the future you or any subsequent owners needing to add a garage uh, well, to, we, to the property? We've never used a garage. I mean, you can store stuff in it. We, uh, we would plan on uh, probably uh, putting a little house in the woods somewhere just to put the bikes in and so forth. But uh, no. We, we did consider that. Uh, but. Uh, first of all, economically, it would be expensive because of uh, foundation and so forth. And uh, we've been without a garage. We don't use it as a, as a garage, so um, we wouldn't have any use for it, except to collect a lot of junk. Mr. Brown, one of the letters endorsing um, your proposed project, are, is one of them submitted by the budding neighbor who you've shown in this picture here? Yes, yes, that is, um, in fact, she was the, she, they were the first ones I, I discussed it with because they were, they would be the one that affect, that would be most affected by it. Um, and they are, um, it is to Macaulay Road. The, I think it's the last one. Is that uh, Kim? Yes, Kim Cole. Kim Cole. <clears throat> In regards to coming forward on your lot, are all the homes on Macaulay Road pretty much parallel to yes. the road equidistant? Yes, yes, and that that was one of the considerations we took. Uh, um, I just think it wouldn't look. It would look. I think it would look foolish, and it would. I think it would hurt the uh, uh, the value of the houses, the neighborhood. As you can see from the overlay, I think it, it goes well with the existing roof line that we have along with our, our neighbor to the right. Other questions? Uh, can I ask, uh, one of the criteria that is that there's no feasible alternative, as you probably heard in the last case. Let me read you the definition of no feasible alternative. In the case of a variance request, there is no other place on the lot taking into consideration the physical constraints of the property and no other location on the structure that, propose, that the proposed construction could go without the need for a variance or without causing the owner to create other compliance problems on the lot because of the zoning ordinance, need restrictions or conditions imposed by lease, to, by lease or contract. Uh, do you think you, you 
meet that, that, that criterion? Yes, uh, I, you know, uh, again, we thought of going over directly over the house, um, but to me, the, the, uh, the roof lines would look horrible. Then we'd have to add on to the existing garage to match the, the new roof line. Um, that wouldn't, uh, I, I would think that wouldn't comply with the neighborhood uh, only because it would look, it would look funny. Uh, if we moved, if we uh, built behind, we would be reducing the privacy of our neighbor. And if we moved in front, we'd be reducing the privacy of our neighbor. Uh, actually, in the front, probably his view behind would be uh, his privacy. The, the audience doesn't seem to address the issue of the privacy of neighbors. Uh, so, and often people build L's on the houses when they need more bedrooms for the kids. And just my question is, is that an alternative? Well, the way we could build the L would be in front of the garage or behind it. Yeah. And uh, if you look at the, uh, at the neighborhood, you'll see that, um, first of all, it wouldn't conform to the existing neighborhood. And if we did, uh, in front or back, uh, my uh, discussions with the neighbors, would, it, would look, it would reduce their view, the front view that they enjoy, and also the privacy in back. So, um. Also, just as a practical note, even if he, I think if, I may be mistaken, but I think if he was to build bef behind or in front of the garage, he still would be faced with the same setback variance yes. that's, that's still correct. in line with the garage. If it was in line with the garage, if it was an L, off the back of the house only. Yeah, that L would have to go behind the garage. The L would have to go behind. Yeah. The yeah. yeah. It would or, still be a 12. Well, the way the house is, the, where the living room is, where the, where the uh, um, connections for a bathroom and all that would have to be there because it, there's existing lines there. If I went to the other side, first of all, I would have to probably get a setback also, uh, but it would cost a lot more to use the other side of the house because those are bedrooms right there. So the physical layout of the house doesn't afford it. Right, right. The, 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 uh, the, the only alternative is to use the existing garage and go straight up. And right now we're not, um, we're, we're, we're not going, uh, we're not increasing the side setback. We are, uh, we're just going straight up. So uh, no, the, the footprint would stay the same. And that was our intent. What are the uh, foundation dimensions of the home as uh, it The existing or the, just the garage? No, the home itself, do you know? I think it's 20, 24, 30 by 24, something like that. So an L, actually an L off the back wouldn't be that practical anyway, it, it seems like it'd be quite narrow. You know, uh, we looked at it, and it would look, it would look like a mobile home. You know, one level, and then an, and then an L. And uh, I wouldn't like the looks of it. And I don't think our neighbors would. There are two letters of support without addresses. Could you uh, identify the location? Yes, um, the Russells are. Is that six Macaul six Macaulay Road, which is right to the left of us. And uh, the Murphys. The Murphys are on the opposite side of the street, which is uh, probably seven Macaulay. And the Mercheskis are probably oh well three Macaulay Road. So the Murphys are directly across the street? Yeah, uh, actually Kitty Corner. And Three Macaulay is the other corner? Three Macaulay, yes. Yes. Did you send out any other letters that you did not get responses to? No. no I just, those were the ones that I uh, uh, discussed it with. These four individuals? Yes. Yes. If at some time in the future it was deemed that the property owner at this address needed a garage, where would you? anticipate that being placed? Uh, probably, I would think the only place would be is either either end of the house. Which I would think, I would think if you had to do it, it would be, a, it would be an L with a second floor coming out, you know, where the garage is now. So you're saying an extension of the current garage to replace the 
on the, the front. parking area that you're right. uh, uh, turning into a family room. Yes. You earlier alluded to a difference um, that it was less expensive to improve the garage as it was to add a, a second story to the existing home. Have you done any research as to what the difference in those costs are? Uh, to build, you mean to build uh, in front or back? Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, instead of adding a second story to the home. Oh, oh yes, added. yeah, you're talking twice the cost. Is that right? Yes. And, and what, the biggest expense is um, the roof line. If we add a second floor, if you see, if you add a second floor, you have it, it, the roof line of the existing roof would be low and the second floor would be high. And then what do you do with that? You'd have to kind of fill it in, which would add an, another expense. And, it's, and I'd, I'd have to come through the same thing as a variance because we'd be building over the garage again. Other questions? Um, I don't know whether this is the time to ask uh, the code enforcement officer a question or not, but I think it's appropriate. Otherwise, I wouldn't ask it. Page 34, Bruce, uh, line 32. Does this apply to this garage? Any enlargement shall not increase the height of that part of the building within the required setback. That only that section applies, would apply for, he could take, get to the Board of Appeals if he wasn't increasing the height. But because he's increasing the height, then he can't use that section. He can okay. only go and seek a variance. Okay. This is another alternative to go to the Board if you weren't increasing the height, if he was expanding outwards at the same height, then he could take advantage of this section. Okay, so he's requ requesting the variance and this does not apply. He can't. He doesn't qualify for that okay. for that All approval right. through the Board uh, of Appeals. That's correct. All right. Um, I don't have a question. I do have a comment. Uh, I don't think you need to go through the the professional uh, survey uh, that the other applicant did, uh, Cam. That you you presented us with with adequate document uh, documentation that I'm comfortable with. You're not expanding the footprint of the building itself. You're going up, so you know your setbacks aren't going to change. Uh, you're asking for something that a number of people have done in Cape Elizabeth. They have a small house. The family uh, gets larger. They want to stay in the neighborhood. They want to stay in the town, and they want to expand expand the property. Uh, there are uh, tremendous uh, limitations. Um, on a number of the lots that we have in Cape Elizabeth, whether it be Ledge, whether it be the placement of the house back uh, in 1970, late 60s when this house was built. And they didn't foresee that someone would buy it and want to expand it. And I think what you're doing is, is uh, certainly within uh, um, the scope of, of the ordinance. And uh, you know, I, I, I feel as though that what he's asking for certainly is uh, something we should consider tonight and vote favorably upon. Other questions for Mr. Brown? Yeah. I bet you may have noticed we're still trying to cope with these new provisions of the ordinance, and so and I'm keep thinking about how they apply in individual situations. Uh, again, the significant economic injury definition is placing the applicant for a variance at a disadvantage in a neighborhood by applying the zoning ordinance standards would prevent the applicant from having a structure or accessory structure comparable in size, location, and number to those of other lot, lot owners in the neighborhood, but in no cases fewer than 10 of the nearest property owners. I'm not quite sure how to interpret that. Uh, do other people in your neighborhood have two-story additions uh, 12 feet from the property line? I, I'm not sure. I know they have two-story additions. I don't know if they're 12 feet from the property line. Um, it's not an exclusive neighborhood. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, like I, I, like I mentioned, I think with the addition we're putting in um, will fit in nicely with the, uh, with the neighborhood. Um, I think uh, going back or forward would look uh, not only uh, would reduce the, uh, 
I think, the uh, conformity of the neighborhood, but also uh, irritate our neighbors, which we don't want to do. Excuse me, you, you Bob, if I might. If I might say something, this house is relatively small compared to the others in the neighborhood. Most of them are two-story colonials. This looked like it was a split foyer with two bedrooms. When I drove by the other day, I was, I was amazed at how small the house was for the neighborhood. The houses on the back side of this, uh, uh, this lot, what, what's the name of the street behind you? It's actually Macaulay. Macaulay Circle, yeah. yeah. Uh, substantially larger. So what he's asking to do is just, just to come up not even to come up with what other people have, but uh, certainly he's still going to be the small house, in, a small house in the neighborhood. Yeah, I didn't do my drive-by with this uh, criteria in the, uh, forward in my mind, so to speak. Oh, I just want to make sure that it's satisfied. And if you say it's satisfied, I believe we're satisfied. There's, could you describe the nature of the land behind your house? There seems to be a great deal of, of yeah, it's, space. It's, it's all it's all woods. Uh, there's there's a small backyard that uh, actually with the addition it would take up, um, and then the rest is all woods, rock, it's all ledge. Um, it's really no use. Um, I know it looks bigger than it. I can't believe how big it looks because we have a small backyard, uh, but it is all rocks and trees. I mean it's it's you know this it's not a forest but it's all woods. So we can't see our neighborhood, our neighbors behind us. Did you uh, look into extending the, the right rear of the house straight back? Uh, you mean uh, on L on the other side? The, the right hand side of the house uh, to the rear. Oh, you mean behind, instead of, yeah, uh, we did look at that, but then again, um, it would be, uh, the, the views of our neighbors behind, uh, to each side of us, it would be restricted um, because there's a view of the woods and so forth. And uh, our, my, I felt that if we put straight back behind the, the, the right-hand side of the house, it would be just the same as adding behind the, the uh, garage. They would restrict their view. Um, Restrict their lateral view. Yes. Yeah. If you go on a back deck, the guy would be looking at our side wall on either side of our house. Are we ready for a show of hands on the six condition six conditions? Just one question. One more question. You are on public sewer and not septic. Yes. Yes, you're on public sewer. Yes. A uh, point of order, though. Uh, I think once you vote on the six conditions, then the approval is pretty much up and down. And I, I, I wonder if, if some free discussion would be more profitable first, and then vote on the conditions up and down. Uh, we can certainly have open discussion. Uh, well, actually, before we do that, um, is there anybody else to speak in favor of the application? Uh, they actually a few of them asked if I needed they needed to come, but you know I just didn't want to put them out. To uh, they did write on the notes that if you ever need someone to speak about it, but no, they're not here. But is there anyone else here tonight to speak in favor of the application? My wife. And is there anyone here to speak against the application? In that case, at this point, we'll close the public comment uh, portion of the hearing. Um, discussion by the board. Um, I agree with Mr. Fristashi's earlier comments in that, um, in light of the new rule, it's um, it is become a little easier in Cape Elizabeth to get the variances. I think that he's done a, a good job at explaining why there are no alternatives given the condition of um, or given the physical constraints of his property in the house. And I agree that in the neighborhood there are a lot of other larger houses, and I think that this is something that we should consider and grant tonight. I guess it would seem to me that, that he can put a second story addition over his existing house and maintain the, uh, the, the garage. I think garages are extremely desirable. I think uh, it's an adverse effect on the neighborhood when you convert a, a garage into a living space and leave your cars out. Uh, I see a practical alternative. I know it's more expensive, although I'm not sure 
Can you tell me how much more expensive it is would be to tear off the roof and build a, build up over the existing house, Joe, than put this in? Maybe Kathy can. She's trying to get prices on on uh, on doing just that. But I would say it's at least twice as much. At least twice. As at much. least twice as much to do to. Uh, you're talking a bigger, a bigger area. The house is is is. Thirty-four by twenty-four, whereas the garage is twenty-four by twenty-four. So you're talking a substantially larger area, uh, and if I'm saying you know twice as much, I might be conservative. Uh, to me, that's a practical difficulty. He's trying to get out of it for something that he can afford, and I'm sure he's he's researched this. Is this your builder with yeah. you? You can tell us better um, what it would cost. You know, give us some numbers. It, come up. But but I, I think that you know he knows what his limitations are and what the value of the house can and should be. But I, mean, I don't think Mr. Brown would do something that that uh, he'd regret down the road. I mean I've known maybe I shouldn't say that I've known the individual from you know from uh, past experiences and and uh, he seems to think things out uh, before he before he jumps. Hi, uh, Tony Bryant. You really can't add too much to that other than for the house to look really nice and to match with the neighborhood. What he's asking to do really fits in. To take that house and raise the main house raises him now above the neighbors on both sides. He's, he's restricting their view, whereas where he's going up over the garage, that neighbor doesn't even have windows on that side, so there's no view being restricted at all. And as it goes up, it goes up about four foot above the existing house line, which really would look much nicer. And cost-wise, <laughs> yeah, double and maybe a little bit more to add a second story to that house. I'm sorry, what was your address? Did I'm sorry? What was your address? Uh, I, I live in Portland, 189 Bracker Street. And I'm an uh, independent builder incorporated in the state of Maine. Okay. Thank Before, you. before bef well, yeah, I think you're well set with you. But, Bruce, do we have a maximum height that we can have on, on houses in this neighborhood? For example, what is the maximum allowable height of this house? Uh, the the, the uh, highest is 35 feet measured from the average original grade to the min mean level of the highest roof. So they, he wouldn't exceed that, even if they went up. He would or would not? He would not. He would not exceed that. We can't give height variances anyway. I'm sorry? So you, we can't give height variances. No, well, I was thinking that maybe the height of this, this building would be, would exceed the maximum height. I mean, you're, you're talking. One and a half floors now and then another. Five feet's a long ways. Yeah. To the mean level, not to the peak, but to the mean level of the highest roof, which is halfway from the ridge, halfway from the eaves to the ridge. It's fairly lenient, actually, compared to most audiences. I think just as another point, I don't think that it's our, um, we need to really assess whether or not he needs a garage. I don't think that's in the cards for us to determine whether he wants to use his garage to put a bike or his car isn't. Our business, and it doesn't seem like come back to us and ask that they have a hard to cut up a garage. But at that point, then we'll we'll determine that variance, and that's not for us tonight. And I think that it's also a little premature to also be determining whether, if he was to sell the house six months from now, whether people that he doesn't know who would buy a house would want a garage. I, I, I yeah. think that those are things that we need don't need to consider. What we're needing to consider is tonight is whether he met the standard for this variance. Yeah, it depends on how strict you want to apply it, too. I, I, I do think it could go up. It's very expensive. Well, the audience doesn't say anything about that, but should be a consideration for us. Yes, I think it should. Uh, but we have to balance off these considerations, and the, the effect upon the neighborhood is one of them. And I think the garage does have an effect upon the neighborhood. I, I think in that context, Mr. Cronin's comment was probably um, valid to the extent that taking away the garage may produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood. Other discussion? Let's go through the six factors. 
Um, can I see a show of hands from members of the board um, as to those who believe that the applicant has established that condition number one has been met, that the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood? Opposed? Four to two. Um, by show of hands, uh, members of the board who believe that the applicant has established that condition number two has been met, that the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not unreasonably detrimentally affect the use or market value of abutting properties. Opposed? Abstaining? I don't know about that one. Um, four in favor, one opposed. One abstain. Um, by show of hands, uh, board members who believe that the applicant has established that condition number three has been met, uh, that the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. Opposed? Uh, five to one. Uh, by show of hands, board members who believe that the applicant has established that condition number four has been met that no other feasible alternative to a variance is available to the petitioner. Opposed? Five to one. Uh, by show of hands, board members who believe that the applicant has established that condition number five has been met, that the granting of the variance will not unreasonably adversely affect the natural environment. Uh, six to zero. And last, um, by show of hands, board members who believe the applicant has established that condition number six has been met, that the property is not located in whole or in part within shoreland areas as described in Title 38, Section 435. And six to zero. With those findings, uh, may I hear a motion? There's no time to be shy. Go ahead, Steve. <laughs> I make a motion to grant the variance of um, the Brown seeking a eight back eight foot setback variance for the property based on the findings of facts and the conclusions as we've determined them tonight. I'll second it. Discussion. Hearing none. All those in favor. Opposed. Sorry. That's an opposed. Uh, the uh, motion uh, is motion carries four to two, and the application is approved. Uh, next on our agenda is communications, and to the best of my knowledge, we have none. Uh, Bruce, do we have any communications to discuss? No, I, uh, I will bring forth the cover letter that, that, that uh, accompanies the applications probably at the next meeting for discussion. Okay. We did also table at the last meeting the uh, proposed amendment to the board's rules and regulations. All right. I, and I failed. To um, we can either take that up again now or we can continue to defer it until next month. I'd like to defer it till next month. I'll see that's on the on the uh, on the communications next month. Okay. Um, the only other item that I'd like to add is um, I'd like to ask uh, Bruce if he wouldn't mind uh, contacting um, the town attorney, Michael Hill. Uh, to ask him to give us, before the next board meeting, um, his opinion as to the proper protocol for us to establish in making findings under the practical difficulty standard. If you would do that. Do we want some elaborated uh, definitions of uh, practical difficulty, economic or, or feasible? Um, well, it, and specifically, if he would 
tell us exactly what findings need to be made as to whether we need to separately find that there is a practical difficulty in addition to the six conditions or whether these six conditions um, by themselves are sufficient findings. To establish practical difficulty. Either whether the Correct. Six establish whether the six conditions by themselves establish the practical difficulty or whether we need to separately find that there is a practical difficulty and that the six enumerated conditions um, exist. Okay. Mr. Chair, are you suggesting either a workshop or an executive session prior to the next meeting? Is that? Um, if it's appropriate, we can, but it may be that uh, the letter from Mr. Hill will adequately answer our question. But we can always go into executive session uh, for that purpose. Depending on how the other board members feel, that might be a, a good thing to, to uh, discuss. I'm not sure that if it's got to be a mood issue because if you don't believe a practical difficulty exists, I, mean, I could see a, somebody asking for a greenhouse meeting all these six criteria, but I'm not going to vote for a variance because. I don't think being without a greenhouse is a, is, is a, is a practical difficulty. And there are very clear definitions here about changes in the neighborhood, what, what comparable houses the neighborhood have. It, it's, it's really pretty straightforward. And I, as you try and struggle this thing and apply the criteria, you know, it, it's not at all clear to me that these aren't more strict than, than the undue hardship ones. It could be an interpretation, Bob, but I think yeah. I think the intent was to relax yeah. the the ordinance to allow additional construction, and I think that's what we're charged with is the intent of the ordinance. Yeah. I think there's a lot more judgment involved in this than the other one. Uh, under the undue hardship, it, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Nobody qualifies. You got to, you know, you look at the case law. It's, nobody would ever qualify. But uh, this requires an awful lot of judgment. Undesirable changes in the neighborhood. I don't know how many. Objective. I don't know how many years we had the other ordinance to go by, but we were still learning every every meeting. Yeah, true. And this is the first, uh, the first applicants that have been before us under the new, uh, the new uh, changes. So, uh, I guess we're expected to to stumble a bit. Hearing no other business to come before the board, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. Captain Jeff, you get the license?